Good afternoon and welcome to our August 23rd, 2022 board business meeting. Welcome to our board members, MCPS staff, and members of our community who are joining us here today and to those who are watching this meeting via live stream on the MCPS website and MCPS TV. Let us begin by standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I will call the roll to recognize board members to establish that we have a quorum, starting with Mr. Kim. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Harris. Good afternoon, everyone. Ms. Mandrowski. Good afternoon, welcome. Ms. Silvestri. Good afternoon. Dr. Daka. Good afternoon. Ms. Evans. Welcome back, everyone. Good afternoon. And Dr. Joftis. Good afternoon. We also want to welcome Dr. Pat Murphy and Mr. Brian Hull. Where is Brian? Oh, he stepped out for a moment. Okay. That's Brian. That's Brian. Before we move forward to approve the agenda, I want to point out an agenda revis revision that we made late yesterday. We have removed the former item 6.10 pertaining to delegation of authority to execute easement and land agreements. We heard from our community on this issue and the board has asked for more information before taking a vote. Now we can begin the meeting with the approval of the revised agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous, thank you. At this time, I'll ask Dr. McKnight to proceed. Item three, how many reasons? All right, item three for human resources report. Uh, move forward the human resources report. Move approval. Okay. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, so today we do have one recommended appointment. I know very different from our previous board meetings. Today we are uh, we had do have one appointment, but we are very excited for that appointment. Um, I bring forward Ms. Heather Deblinski, uh, recommended appointment for the position of executive director in the office of the chief operating officer. Ms. Deblinski is joined here with her family who are actually watching online. Yes. Uh, she wants to thank her family as well as all of her Montgomery County Public Schools colleagues and mentors who have supported her throughout her career. Ms. Deblinski has been employed with Montgomery County Public Schools for 22 years as a staffing secretary, administrative staffing secretary, staffing assistant, data management and assessment specialist, acting coordinator, coordinator, assistant to the associate superintendent, and most recently as coordinator in the office of the school system medical officer. Ms. Deblinski is honored and excited to join the office of the chief operating officer, where she will support principals and schools and promote a system of operational excellence. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous. Thank you so much, Ms. Wolf. We do have a couple of uh, recognitions of uh, employees who we've lost, and I will share those with yours. The first being the death on July 11th, 2022, of Ms. Ifalma Dzingbi, occupational therapist at Early Childhood Disabilities, has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the one year that Ms. Dzingbi worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she established and managed student learning while contributing to a positive learning environment. She always modeled respect for her students, colleagues, and community. Ms. Zadingbi was committed to the academic success of her students. Her sessions with students demonstrated her strong commitment to them and their learning. It revealed an in-depth knowledge of her field and confirmed her effectiveness at assessing, analyzing, and adapting her program to each student. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express our sorrow at the death of Ms. Zadingbi and extend deepest sympathy to her family. With approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. 
That is unanimous. Thank you. Uh, the second resolution I have is acknowledging the death on July 14th, 2022 of Ms. Svetlanam Klimchenko, special education paraeducator at Jackson Road Elementary School, has deeply saddened the staff, students, and members of the Board of Education. During the 21 years Mrs. Klimchenko worked for Montgomery County Public Schools, she served as a strong role model for students and contributed to an effective, enjoyable learning environment. She helped build positive and supportive classroom experiences for all of the students with whom she worked. Mrs. Klemjenko was willing to provide support wherever she was needed and always maintained a friendly demeanor. Now therefore, be it resolved that the members of the Board of Education and the Superintendent of Schools express our sorrow at the death of Mrs. Klemchenko and extend deepest sympathy, sympathy to her family. Move approval. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item on the agenda is public comments. Public comments is one of our opportunities to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. Board members will take your comments into consideration, but it is not our practice to take action at this time on issues that are raised. We encourage public input on policy, program, and practices. This is not the proper avenue to address specific student or employee matters, so we encourage everyone to utilize existing avenues of redress for complaints. This is a public meeting, and we expect the conduct of all speakers and members of the audience to be within the bounds of proper etiquette. Inappropriate per personal remarks, rude retorts, or other such behavior is out of order and will not be tolerated. Those who demonstrate disruptive or disrespectful behavior during public comments may be asked to leave. Please check our website for information about upcoming board meetings, hearings, and work sessions, including any changes to our meeting start times. We have six people signed up to provide in-person testimony. Each speaker will receive two minutes. When your name is called, approach the table, speak clearly and directly into the microphone. 30 seconds prior to the expiration of a speaker's time, a yellow light will go on accompanied by a beep. A red light and a buzzer signals that your time has expired. Please push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Push the same button to turn it off. In addition to our in-person speakers today, we have two audio testimonies and 11 video presentations. We will play these submissions once the in-person testimonies have concluded. Copies of testimonies can be found on board docs where they are posted with the other materials for this meeting. At this time, I'm going to call to the table Kimberly Fogg, Sachet Karada, and Jonathan DeWitt. Please, please speak in the order that I called you. Kimberly Fogg. Go ahead. Thank you. Turk, push the. Go oh, ahead. Are you ready it's for on. me to go? I'm sorry. Yes, it's on. Oh. It's on. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kimberly Fogg, and I am the founder and CEO of Global Sustainable Partnerships. And this is Nita Finley, who manages our mental health, first aid adult, and youth trainings. We would like to thank the Board of Education for providing Global Sustainable Partnerships this opportunity to comment on mental health concerns among our youth at school and offer opinions as to how we can best serve our students and create a better teaching and learning environment for our students in these difficult times. As a 501c3, GSP has worked with Title I schools in Montgomery County Public Districts to provide COVID education and outreach, vaccinations to students and their parents for the past two years. So today we're here to talk about how we can help to improve the mental health status of our youth in Montgomery County Public Schools. 
The past two years, COVID challenges have contributed to the creation of a true mental health crisis for students and pushed the mental health of many individuals to a breaking point and now has become a state of emergency for our youth. Children are struggling with, sense, with stresses they've never faced and they're feeling new levels of anxiety and depression as a result. Furthermore, mental health among teens is a growing problem. We provide mental health first aid training, so we hope to provide this type of training to empower our teachers, school staff, because teachers are more likely to encounter a young person in a mental health crisis than having a heart attack. And training them is critical to teach them how to spot signs of mental illness, give them the appropriate tools to intervene, and help decrease the stigma associated with it. There are a little bit over 11,500 teachers and our goal is to teach 25% of the teachers with training 100% within four years. We need resources allocated from you for the teachers to be able to take the training to help our children walk to the road to reinvention, recovery, and healing. Let's remember, first aid sometimes isn't a band-aid, sometimes it's us. We thank you for your time and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Sasha Karada. May I? Yeah. Go ahead. Good afternoon, esteemed members of the board, and thank you for allowing me to speak at today's meeting. My name is Sachet Karada, and I am a student at Pulso High School. I am also a member of the community FTC team 47 Beavers. The 47 Beavers have operated since 2016 and have participated every year since then in the annual First Tech Challenge game competition. However, we have struggled with being able to cover costs for our robot and operations, such as team registration and competing fees. Our robot is heavily funded by grants and community donations from interested parties, like Lockheed Martin and the Maryland Robotics Center. However, a financial solution like this is unreliable and leaves our team's future in question. This is a problem faced by multiple robotics teams in our county. Teams like Equilibrium.exe have their members pay 1.5k in fees in order to fund their robot, while many other teams such as Helix Hackers and the Flamangos have dissolved since due to the high cost and general instability that robotics poses towards community-based teams like us. This also reduces the inclusivity of robotics, making underprivileged students with a weaker financial background unable to properly have access to the activity. During the Board of Education business meeting back in June, my associates Eckert and Tyler presented a request for increased support for robotics teams. We presented about the benefits that robotics provides to these students and the problems that they face. Since then, we have pre prepared a white paper document that outlines these issues along with the solutions that we have. Our proposal includes a more in-depth analysis of the issues, including space, cost, and sustainability constraints. We also request a grant system for robotics to be placed by MCPS to provide more stability while also fostering students' writing skills. This is in conjunction with al allocating some unused buildings in the county as a space from our practice. More solutions are expanded upon in our proposal document. Thank you for your time. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. DeWitt. Um, Excuse me. I am unable to provide a testimony. I couldn't get this cleared amongst my associates, so I apologize. Okay, thank you. Okay, next I'm going to ask um, Chelsea Lewis, Hannah Fisher, and Fanya Yangarber to come to the table. Please speak in the order you were called. Absolutely. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chelsea Lewis. And first of all, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Chelsea Lewis again, and I am a graduate of the Client Leadership Council of the Capital Area Food Bank. My children and I have been living here in Montgomery County for almost two years now. I am a single parent of three. My twins are starting their senior year next Monday, yay, at Richard Montgomery, <laughs> college bound. And my youngest is um, in his second year of middle school. I'm here to express how important healthy meals in schools are to not only to my, me and my family, but to all families. 
I have battled with food insecurities myself for a very long time, and that was primarily due to me not earning a comfortable enough salary at the jobs that I've had. I realized my barrier was not having a college degree, because we all know having a college degree equates to higher salaries in this job market. That is why I am in college full-time at Bowie State University in Bowie, Maryland, graduating next May with a degree in history. Oh. Yay! <laughs> And I decided to do this, you guys, so that I can overcome the financial barriers that I have been faced with for years. I've had to depend on school breakfasts and lunches to feed my children, and it is important for all children to receive healthy, tasty meals while attending school. I believe school meal programs are critical because they provide children with the nutrition they need to be able to thrive in school and out of school. A child that does not eat breakfast or lunch they are unable to focus while in school. I mean, really, who can focus on anything when your stomach is growling? Can you? Because I know I cannot. Because I certainly know that offering these school meals to all children at no cost is a huge step toward ending childhood hunger. I'm very grateful to the federal government for waiving the income eligibility requirements for the free school meals. And now, since that program has ended, it is time for this wonderful, beautiful county that we reside in to pick up the torch and to do the same. Providing these meals at no cost will give all parents the security of knowing. Thank you. We okay. have your testimony. Sorry about Thank that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. We have jobs. <laughs> When you graduate. <laughs> Hi, my name is Hannah Fisher. I'm on the steering committee for Seven Locks Alliance, a coalition of Potomac and West Rockville neighborhoods. Our mission is to address issues affecting the area. Our organization's current concern regards the county's proposal to relocate a bus depot from Crabs Branch Way to the detention center site. This tract of land is within Rockville city limits, but is county owned. On August 9th, 2022, the Rockville City Council addressed a letter to elected county officials opposing the proposed relocation of the bus depot. Previously, two Rockville neighborhoods successfully opposed relocating the bus depot to their areas. One was Lickin Park, a historic African-American enclave. The other location surrounds the building in which this meeting is being held. We are very concerned that the delegation of authority to the school superintendent or designee regarding land-related issues will effectively eliminate the opportunity for public comment. The county's legal and facility staff reviews cannot substitute for resident involvement in issues affecting property values and homeowner rights. This proposal suffers from indefinite drafting. For example, what is routine? The resolution only references adjoining landowners once at the very end. In the name of administrative efficiency, the Board of Education is in danger of offloading its responsibility to constituents, sacrificing transparency and democratic processes. Based on the Parents Coalition blog, it shares the position of Seven Locks Alliance. Both organizations regard this tact action as a tactic to avoid further opposition to relocating the bus depot. Moreover, the depot is only the proverbial tip of the iceberg. Where will the 130 buses be parked that won't fit in the proposed 270 bus depot? What about other land-related issues with serious public implications? Anyway, thank you for giving thank me you. the opportunity. You. And I actually have corrections. I had you can hand them to um, Miss Van Dyke there, okay. right there. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm Fanya Yangarber of Healthy School Food, Maryland. I've come before the board to talk about the school meal system before and the thousands of kids it affects. Last time I told you Chelsea's story and I'm very excited that she agreed to come and tell you herself. So this time I'll tell you my story. I came to this country before the school meal programs were gutted, which advocates like me have been laboriously trying to restore and improve for decades. I came as a refugee fleeing religious persecution in the former Soviet Union. A community of advocates, including Silver Spring-based HIAS, helped get my family to the U.S. And the school I attended was another amazing community. They knew we were living on public assistance while we got on our feet and made sure I had a hot lunch at school for free every day. 
My family never had to apply. The school administrators handled all the logistics and simply sent a note home, letting my parents know that their children would be taken care of. I still remember feeling awed that someone had taken the time to do that for me because my family would never have known where to even start. Certainly on a practical level, it made sense for the school to have every child that was eligible for school meals enrolled in the program because it meant more government funding to purchase and prepare food. More meals meant higher purchasing powder, power and greater efficiency. But for me, it has always meant that something as simple as a school lunch could signal support, solidarity, and caring to a young child. The pandemic is a once in a century global disruption. Disruption is uncomfortable, but it's also an opportunity to honestly evaluate what wasn't working and rebuild better. The school meal program was broken. Do not return to the outdated and ineffective way of doing things from the past. We're asking the board again to be the heroes this crisis calls for. Be the leaders our school needs. Thank you. Okay, we've received two audio testimonies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first up is Laura Stewart. Please play the audio. My name is Laura Stewart, and I'm speaking today as CIP Chair and a Health and Wellness Committee member. Thank you so much for considering the indoor air quality monitoring contract that is on the cassette agenda today. We have been collaborating with MCPS, especially with Seth Adams, on air quality throughout the airborne COVID-19 pandemic. We've had a true partnership resulting in a pilot CO2 monitoring program at Poolsville High School. We are grateful for these efforts and hope to continue partnering in the future. Unfortunately, COVID-19 is still transmitting in the community today. It is not as deadly, but it continues to disrupt lives. We need to do our best to keep children and staff in school and healthy by continuing mitigation strategies when transmission levels are high, including vaccinations, masking, and reducing virus particles in the air. MCPS could, should continue to use air filters, consider using masking mandates when the community transmission is high, and allow cozy Rosenthal boxes in the cafeteria. We have the tools to reduce risk. We just need to use them when warranted. Monitoring air quality will not only help us reduce airborne virus transmission like COVID-19 and influenza, but it will also detect other potentially unhealthy aspects of air quality. Too much humidity causes mold growth and even too much CO2 levels can cause drowsiness. The data collected will highlight issues before they become problems and can assist in prioritizing HVAC modernizations. I also ask that the data be made public, which will help build trust in the community. MCCPTA will be happy to assist the public in interpreting the data in coordination with MCPS. Thank you again for all your efforts in keeping the school community healthy. Next is Kia Zhao. Please play the audio. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight and members of the Board of Education. My name is Kai Zhou, and I'm a sophomore at Winston Churchill High. I'm testifying on behalf of the organization Sex Education for All. After taking health over the summer, I was relatively satisfied with the curriculum. I appreciate the mention of LGBTQ gender identity and the recognition of many forms of contraception. I also appreciated how comprehensive it was into things such as HIV AIDS and consent, which are important topics to learn about. However, I was disappointed in sex education in specific. According to the CDC, sex education should address the health needs of all students, including the needs of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. And there was no mention of LGBTQ sex in the curriculum. It's important to recognize how essential it is to at least mention LGBTQ sex so the people of the community feel heard and represented in their curriculums, especially considering the fact that STDs can spread through LGBTQ sex in addition to heterosexual sex, it's really important to teach. Furthermore, I was disappointed on what, why it was so pro-abstinence. Um, in this day of age, it's been shown that abstinence-only education continues to fail and cause teen pregnancy to go up. Although other contraception forms were taught, it was disappointing how unbelievably pro-abstinence it was. According to Columbia Health, two scientific review papers find abstinence-only until marriage programs and policies 
in the United States ineffective because they do not delay sexual initiation or reduce sexual risk behaviors. Although the curriculum is just pro-abstinence and not abstinence only, the principle stands. However, I really do appreciate MCPS's work in LGBTQ equality in the schools and for the students. And I think just adding it to our health curriculum could be a step in the right direction in the future. Thank you for listening. Okay, we have 11 video testimonies. First up is a joint video testimony from Pia Morrison, Christine Handy, and Jennifer Martin. Hi, my name is Pia Morris and I'm president of SEIU Local 500 and I'm here today with my fellow union presidents, Jennifer Martin and Christine Handy. The very least you can do in your life is figure out what you hope for. And the most you can do is live inside that hope. Not admire it from a distance, but live right in it, under its roof. The night before the beginning of the school year always brought hope for our students. Hope for a great first day, hope for being with the great staff and having classes with your friends, and hope for what the rest of the school year can bring. It's a feeling that we, even as adults long removed from our first days of school, still feel today. It's that feeling that got me up this morning and brought me to join my union sisters as we speak in front of you all today. This has been a tumultuous time for all of us in public education, whether we are staff or students. We are all adjusting to the new realities of a continuing COVID outbreaks, worsening political divisions, and troubling economic uncertainty. As the new school year begins, communities across the country question whether we are committed to rebuilding for equity and excellence, or whether our goal is to return to a status quo that left too many people behind. At educator town halls and community canvases, those we serve have not been shy about voicing their skepticism about our ability to be the school system our students need and deserve. Superintendent McKnight and members of the Board of Education, we are here because we refuse to accept problems as unsolvable, and instead we are choosing hope. Hope this year we can put behind us a tragic pandemic that has claimed too many lives. Hope that we can again give our students consistent and uninterrupted opportunities for meaningful learning. And hope that we can restore dignity and respect for the dedication and excellence that MCPS employees demonstrate every day in their work to support our young people. If we do not have hope for MCPS and for the future we are working towards, then we are little better than those who are actively working to see public education fail. This school year, we have greater investments in our schools and a new cohort of administrators who are about to lead a school for the very first time. It reminds me of the excitement that I felt as a new principal. I remember that drive like it was a drive I made this morning. There were the cheerleaders cheering and the band playing, and I never thought negatively about the year ahead. I always made a vow to my staff, my school, and my community that it was going to be an amazing year. We make a difference here. I have sat with administrators, both new and experienced, who are excited and ready to welcome students and staff back. The challenges we faced the past few years have strengthened our resolve. We must make sure that our schools, staff, and students get the support they need. Let's make this the year that MCPS will carefully consider priorities and seek to eliminate some of the unnecessary burdens placed on those working in our system. My union colleagues and I stand before you ready to help establish student-centered, people-focused, policies and programs to ensure our employees can give their best and our students can achieve their full potential this year. We view ourselves as partners with you in ensuring that every young person in our care gets the very best education in a school community that focuses on the well-being of each individual. This school year also presents us with an opportunity to restore morale and repair relationships. This fall, all three unions will enter contract negotiations with MCPS. Our members will be seeking proof of the respect that MCPS has for its employees. The new contract must show evidence that we are highly valued for the work we do to prepare our students to thrive and to prosper throughout their lives. Having struggled this year to fill all staff openings, we need to make sure MCPS becomes once again a destination employer. 
Many have noted that the so-called teacher shortage is a national problem, but this is the wrong way to define the issue. First, as Petula Dvorak recently wrote in the Washington Post, the teachers are out there. They've just had enough of the real shortage that is decaying their profession. Respect, value, common sense, and safety. Second, while it is true that the problem is national, school systems are managed and funded largely by their districts, so the solutions must lie at the local level. Our hope is that MCPS will come to the bargaining table this year ready to make changes that will encourage our members to stay here. We need contracts that will attract excellent talent for every job category in our system. As we work to improve these negotiated agreements, we can't afford to simply compare ourselves to what our other school systems are doing in the area. We must look at other sectors of the economy to see what strategies excellent employers are using to attract and retain talented and dedicated employees. Our three unions have hope that this school year will give us all a fresh start in the work we do together with you to make Montgomery County Public Schools the best they can be. Next is Chuck Thomas. Please play the video. Hi, I'm Chuck Thomas. Both of my daughters are Blair High School students. Today I'm asking you to please reinstate universal mask mandates whenever the community levels reach high. This is a compromise. I believe that masking should be mandatory, uh, certainly when the levels are medium or any time before this pandemic is over. Um, but I'm asking for it to be mandatory at the high level because on uh, July 22nd, the State Board of Education uh, said uh, what the CDC has already said, and that is that universal indoor mask wearing uh, should happen whenever the community levels are high and it won't be universal if it's not mandatory. So uh, I know that the PTA's Health and Wellness Committee recently asked the same thing. Prince George's County uh, recently reinstated mask mandates after uh, rescinding them for some time. Uh, this summer, for much of August, the community levels were high. Thankfully, they're back down again, but they will go back up again. And while the numbers were high in August, my daughter played on uh, the summer volleyball team and uh, had to be uh, around other people heavily breathing without masks on. We know that the science is clear that universal masking is much safer than just one person uh, wearing a mask. In fact, it's seven times as safe. I've sent you this information in the past. Uh, so we would like the clarity and the transparency to make it clear that when the numbers go back up and reach the high level, masking would be mandatory Again, there's no reason not to. There was a slate of candidates who ran uh, anti-masking, anti-mitigation, and uh, they all lost with 20% uh, of the vote, the three outspoken anti-masking people. So there's nothing to fear by doing so. Thank you very much. Next is Jonathan Thesson. Good afternoon, President Wolf and members of the board. My name is Jonathan Thesson. I'm the parent of three students in first through fourth grade at Bell Elementary School. I'm testifying today because it is imperative that the board set clear policy to ensure the health and safety of students, teachers, administrators, and staff when the school year begins. Montgomery County's COVID-19 community level status is currently listed as high. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends that individuals wear a mask indoors in public when a community's transmission level is high. MCPS should follow the CDC's recommendation and require universal masking in MCPS schools. If MCPS does not adopt universal masking, we are likely to experience increased teacher, staff, and student absences, temporary school shutdowns, and significant learning loss. When transmission rates are high, students who are immunocompromised or at high risk of complications from COVID-19 infection are particularly at risk when other children and teachers in their classrooms do not wear masks. Requiring universal masking at this time aligns with MCPS's values of equity and inclusion for all children. Notably, our neighboring county, Prince George's County, has already made the decision to impose universal masking. I also urge the board to set a clear policy for when universal masking will be required in schools. 
In addition, I urge the board to express its continued support for all schools to offer outdoor lunch to all students on all days when there is not a significant weather event. Outdoor lunch is the best way for schools to mitigate the spread of COVID-19 transmission during the period of day when all students must be unmasked and therefore greatest risk of exposure to COVID-19. I appreciate that the reopening guide, quote, encourages schools to implement outdoor lunch, but outdoor lunch should not just be encouraged, it should be the expectation for all schools. School leaders should also be supported in recruiting and utilizing parent volunteers to offer outdoor lunch, particularly if staffing lunch is a challenge. Thank you for your attention to these important issues. Next is Kristen Erdheim. Please. I am Kristen Erdheim and have one MCPS graduate and three students currently in MCPS. I'm addressing concerns around the transportation of athletes for the upcoming fall season. My daughter played two sports over the past four years and was transported by bus only a handful of times. When buses aren't ordered for away games where there are no public transportation options, teams have two choices. Parents leave work early to drive players or older players on the team drive their teammates. Once my daughter was licensed, she assumed that driving role. She wasn't always comfortable doing it, but she was a captain and felt responsible for her teammates getting to away games. One of her friends actually got into an accident driving teammates home from an away game. Thankfully, no one was injured, but this situation could have potentially been avoided. Do we really want an accident to happen to some of our student athletes before changing the way we transport our athletes to away games? Let's not be reactive, but proactive. Historically, teams used to be responsible for funding their buses, which is why some teams, especially smaller ones, may not have used them. Spending team funds for a bus meant they would have less money available for uniforms or equipment. But now that central office pays for the buses directly, shouldn't there be a system-wide expectation of buses for all away games? Not only will providing buses address the safety issues, but these bus trips to away games provide bonding opportunities for our teams as they spend extra travel time with each other. I realize we have a bus driver shortage and there are only limited hours available for bus transport to athletic competitions, which may not always be convenient to game times. In situations where students must be transported by private vehicle, MCPS should at the very least have a requirement in place for athletes similar to MCPS regulation IPDRA. Only after my daughter's friend had an accident did I begin to think about the liability our family was assuming when my daughter was expected to transport her teammates. My ask of the board today, ensure buses are the first option for away games. If students are ever needed to transport teammates, follow IPDRA and require written consent of the owner for the student to transport students and submit proof of insurance. And set boundaries on the distance acceptable for use of students transporting students. Thank you very much for your time. Next is Leah Bradley. I am Leah Bradley and have a current MCPS senior and freshman. I am also a licensed social worker and very concerned about the mental health of teenagers. I am here today to discuss my concerns with every student being able to have fans at sporting events. According to the MCPS Athletic Handbook, spectators must be charged for certain sports games and venues. Other sports may charge admission at the school's discretion. I understand there's a financial impact, but this policy is preventing some athletes from having spectators at any of their games. This is absolutely intolerable and unacceptable. For a school system that prides itself on focusing on social emotional health and equity, how can you in good conscience have a system that prevents families and friends from attending games and showing unconditional support? I have witnessed girls leaving a basketball game at school and getting into their parents' cars. When asked why their parents were not in the gym watching, they responded that their parents couldn't afford to watch the game. There are multiple complimentary passes available to people in the school system, including administrators, teachers, and substitutes. Unless you can provide me with another option, I have three proposals. Take your pick. One, MCPS provides a fan pass to every athlete each season to share with friends and family. Two, MCPS provides all farm eligible students with a fan pass so that they can attend games of their friends and can share with family. This would likely not have any impact on gate receipts, as it's targeting those attendees who would not be attending otherwise. Three, the community can start a campaign that encourages those with complimentary passes to partner with a sports team at their school and offer to share their pass with family and friends of players to ensure that they can attend games. I, along with other concerned parents, are willing and able to start this campaign immediately so we can ensure that all of our fall sports players have a fan in the stands at least once during the season. Please follow up and let me know which option you choose. Thank you. Next is Cynthia Simonson. I'm Cynthia Simonson here on behalf of MCCPTA. As you know, MCCPTA has a long history of advocating for the safety of our children and the emotional well-being. Today, you've heard two public 
comments asking the Board of Education as part of the reopening of schools to pay attention to the high school athletics program. We're requesting the following adjustments immediately. One, improve the controls and permissions around the use of private vehicles to transport teams to school-sponsored games. And second, ensure every student athlete has a complimentary fan pass for each game in which they compete, or at least some methodology in order to ensure those athletes have fans in the audience. To the first point, if you have a student athlete, you know the broad permissions you give providing blanket approval for a child to ride with any student anywhere, anytime through the registration process. At no point do we confirm that the driver has permission of the parent or guardian to drive their peers. And at no point do we confirm with the parent and guardian that they're willing to accept that liability. I challenge you to consider if an athlete is driving a group of teammates to an MCPS scheduled game and there's an incident that results in serious injury to any of the athletes, you will ask questions. So ask those questions now. Let's be proactive in cleaning up these procedures. To the second point, the best game of a 16-year-old's life should be shared and celebrated with the child support system, whether that be a parent, a friend, or a neighbor. Talk about supporting a child's social-emotional health. As a farms-eligible student, I was always very hesitant to ask others to spend money that they may or may not have. What a gift we can give when, with very likely very little revenue impact by extending a fan pass to our student athletes. And finally, I'll remind you, as I did at the July board meeting last spring, Dr. McKnight pledged to conduct an audit of the athletics program based on the concerns our delegates raised to the MCCPDA e-list. Four months later, as we enter another athletic season, We've seen no specific action on those items. I've included the list in my written testimony, and I urge you to engage in this discussion as part of your oversight to ensure this audit is completed. Next is Caleb Lazar. Good morning, Superintendent. Good morning, Board of Education members. My name is Caleb, and I am going into the fourth grade. I enjoy summer school because I made new friends. Like I like seeing my friends laugh, laugh, and smile. Thank you for giving me compensatory services with Mr. Teddy. Mr. Teddy helps me to read, write, and comprehension in life skills. Mr. Teddy helps with me with math and counting by hundred. This helps me to raise my hand in class to and answer questions in reading, math, science, and social studies. I feel safe in school because I, the teachers and principal are here. here. I hope all my friends have a teaching that helps them to learn new things. I don't like the food at school, which I taste better at. I have more torches, more choices. I thank you, Superintendent, for and Board of Education for your service. Have a nice day. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Adam Zimmerman. Good afternoon. My name is Adam Zimmerman. My wife and I live in Rockville. Our children attend Bell Elementary School. Since 2020, federal nutrition waivers provided every child in the United States with access to free school meals, regardless of family income level. An additional 10 million children nationwide, including an additional 10,000 MCPS students, reap the benefits. Unfortunately, the waivers are ending. Despite severe ongoing economic challenges for families and widespread calls to continue this remarkably successful effort, neither the federal government nor the Maryland legislature has acted. More than 160,000 MCPS children now turn to you, their last, best, and only hope. I urge the board to secure additional funding from the county council immediately to continue this policy for the upcoming school year. Continuing this support is critical. Food prices have spiked more than 10% since last year, the largest increase in four decades. More than 25 million families nationwide are currently experiencing food insecurity, 
including 60,000 here in Montgomery County. Given the high cost of living in Montgomery County relative to the national average, federal income eligibility guidelines for free school meals do not come close to reaching every child in need here. There's a better way. For a modest upfront cost, we can invest in the long-term health and well-being of our kids. Research shows that free school meals for all children reduces hunger, improves nutrition, and helps kids do better in class. Returning to a more normal school experience would obviously be welcome this year, but an outdated and ineffective school meal system should stay in the past. If we truly value every child's physical and mental health, social and emotional development, and academic success, we should ensure they all have the nutritious food they need to grow and thrive. Free school meals works. Our kids deserve it. Our families need it. Our leaders should provide it. Thank you. Next is Kate Ledoux. Hello, my name is Kate Ledoux. I'm a recent graduate of Wooten High School and my younger brother will begin his freshman year there next week. Today, I'm speaking in support of Healthy School Meals for All Montgomery, the extension of a free school lunch program for the upcoming school year. As you may know, MCPS served an average of around 10,000 additional meals per day for the 2021 to 2022 school year, showing countywide demand for a universal free lunch. All students deserve access to a lunch at school if they need one, and no student should have to endure anxieties that may come with no longer having access to this lunch and the financial strain that this could imply. As an MCPS graduate, I can vouch there are more than enough stressors during a typical school day, and students should not be subjected to an additional point of worry. Youth nutrition and food security are also linked to focus and academic performance. By making a lunch available to any student who needs one, the county ensures they can thrive. I am concerned by the major discrepancy between the national free and reduced price meals cutoff and the household income necessary for self-sufficiency in Montgomery County. Many families across the county are above the farms cutoff but below the Montgomery County self-sufficiency standard and may struggle to provide lunches for their children yet are unable to benefit from farms. Under Healthy School Meals for All Montgomery, if families do not fill out a farms form, MCPS can still gather demographic information from sources like household income information forms. Thus, concerns pertaining to farms applications and school funding should not impede or influence a decision to make meals free for students. Many families are still working to find their footing after over two years of pandemic-related economic uncertainty. Financial repercussions of COVID did not end suddenly on the last day of school in June. I believe it is crucial that this program does not end suddenly either. Thank you for your time. I hope you will consider healthy school meals for all Montgomery for the fall. This concludes public comments. The next business meeting of the Board of Education is September the 8th. Sign-ups for public comment will open the evening of Tuesday, August the 30th. In addition to the online sign-ups for public comment, we have returned to the practice of in-person same-day sign-ups <clears throat> when space allows. Unallocated slots may be filled on a first-come, first-served basis on the day of the meeting. In order to sign up in person, please arrive at least 15 to 20 minutes before the start of the open session. In-person signups will close 15 minutes before public comment begins or when all slots are filled. At this time, I'll go around and ask my board members if they have any comments. But before I do, I want to say, Caleb, if you're watching, you did a fantastic job, and we want you to know how proud we are of you. So if I see your light on, I will call on you. Dr. Joftis. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. Um, I just wanted to thank the, those advocates um, who are testifying on behalf of uh, food insecurity. Um, and I just kind of wanted to raise this as an issue for the board. Um, we've had an opportunity to discuss this a little bit, and I just wanted to raise the issue with the community that the board this past spring, I believe it was, is that right? Um, passed a, a policy that will make food available, uh, hot meals available for any student who wants it, regardless of ability to pay for it. Um, in the past, I know the schools have provided um, op uh, less than typical options for students who could not afford, such as a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That policy has been removed and 
all students will get access to um, to a full uh, meal of their choice. And then also um, the board, along with the school system and uh, the school's foundation, has committed to making sure that no student, and please correct me if I'm wrong, fellow board members, but this is um, my, my understanding, um, make sure that no de uh, experience no debt as a result of, um, of their meal. So again, students will be able to access a full choice of, of meal selections regardless of whether they are uh, have applied for farms, although we certainly encourage that for everybody who's eligible because it helps the school system uh, recover uh, Title I funds that helps um, helps pay for some of these helps pay for some of these meals. So I just wanted to assure folks that while um, it, it's true that we're not providing free meals for every student, uh, we have put in place the policies and systems to enable all students to have make sure that no student does not get a, am I saying that right that no that every student should get access to a uh, to a meal of their choice regardless of of their ability to pay thanks thank you mr kim uh, yeah thank you dr Joftis, for for raising those points uh, that infrastructure uh, of that program uh, is sustainable not just for this upcoming 2022-2023 school year uh, but to make sure that for years to come uh, students will continue to have access to meals uh, regardless of their ability to pay for it. Um, and, and that's really important work. I, I think that um, looking at solutions in the long term as opposed to uh, securing funding year by year or maybe just for the year ahead uh, is really critical. Uh, I look forward to um, in the year ahead seeing how that program actually does reach students and, and look forward to the work we can do uh, to ensure that it does. Um, and thank you to everyone who came out to, to share their, their testimony, students of, of all ages uh, coming out to voice their concerns. Thank you for the, the valuable feedback you brought to the board. Thank you. Okay, I'm not seeing any other lights. Oh, oh Lynn, you know what? You gotta move the thing so I can see it. Go ahead, Ms. Harris. Yeah, thank you. And I do wanna echo uh, Mr. Kim and Dr. Joftis' comments. Um, we were hearing so much um, in, in a really um, thoughtful way from a lot of our um, um, healthy meal advocates and I guess one of my concerns that we're seeing that the system MCPS has a patchwork system to ensure um, any student that needs or wants a meal at school can get it regardless um, and you know we're, we're seeing increased completion of farms forms this year the increased ability to directly certify students for farms eligibility but the gap between the threshold and and you know a living wage in a high cost of living area like ours is real. And I'd just like us to continue to have the conversation about how we can have, as the way we do business every year, <coughs> fully fund meals for all instead of relying on, on this sort of patchwork. Um, keeping an eye on how we're doing and uh, continuing to, to partner with the advocates and the allies to come <coughs> up with really creative solutions. Um, because um, again, not wanting to have this battle to fight every year, but having just a really solid plan in place that is maybe less reliant on a lot of um, bureaucratic paperwork because we do know um, that every student needs healthy food to do their best work. Um, and then the question I have, so I want to thank very much the, the Beaver 47 crew okay. over here. Um, and would it be possible, they have a white paper to talk about how the system can help support the robotics teams across the county in, in having a steady stream of funding to ensure they can fully um, participate in the activities and also the, the competitions in which they participate, which those are amazing. Um, would it be possible for, to get a meeting for these students to discuss their white paper with somebody in Mr. Hall's office or the, the finance office? Um, so that we can really, it sounds like they've really thought this through and, um, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Harris. So first, I also want to congratulate the Beaver 47. Mm -hmm. I had a chance just to glance over the white paper and I mean, just impressive. Mm -hmm. um, I'm actually going to take the time to read it after the meeting is completed, as I'm sure many of the board members will, because you really got into some of the specifics around the need and the benefits in the program, and of course, uh, we want to take the learning that you you took into action here, and uh, and broaden that. So, yes, Ms. Harris, exactly what you said is as a follow up. I will ask Dr. Pugh 
to um, be in touch with you all to schedule a meeting so that we can sit and talk and really think about what are the implications that are in that white paper and how we can appropriately take those into consideration um, to benefit our students. But again, just your diligence to your work, the fact that you so nicely captured it in this white paper is just absolutely impressive. Thank you. Yeah, and just the last thing, I see a, a lot of issues raised in our public comment, I believe is really gonna be addressed in the presentation, so I really appreciate the way the system has kind of um, projected in advance some of the concerns and comments that we've been hearing from our communities, and so all of you people who testified, especially those who weren't here in person, stay tuned. <laughs> Ms. Mandrowski. Yep, thank you. I will associate myself with many of the, uh, most, all of the comments of my colleagues. Um, but I also wanted to uh, ask follow-up um, when they, after the meeting, if we could get some, I know that we do have money in our budget to help support robotics programs, but I don't know exactly how it's broken up into schools and whether or not these costs in this very well put together, mm -hmm. uh, white pages, is school specific program specific, team specific, um, and so, you know, if there's a variance between how much each school requires to participate in the program and things like that, so we could have a full picture of what, what the needs are. I appreciate that, thank you. And then, um, I wasn't sure if we were gonna be speaking um, on the issue of the athletics that were raised uh, by multiple people during the presentation of opening the schools, um, or if that's something that we wanted to maybe comment on now. So um, let me back up for just a second on the first item. We actually had this conversation in one of the previous board meetings. Yeah, it may have been a BB47 yeah, member that came forward. And we talked a little bit about how we provide their alloc alloc allocation to all of the schools, but it is ultimately up to the school in terms of how they want to disperse those funds based on student interest, based on staff availability, to be able to cover uh, the programs that are provided. But the opportunity I really see in the white paper that the students highlighted is sometimes some of the students in our schools don't actually know the benefit of some of these programs unless they're actually hearing it from their peers. So what I'd like for us to do is just highlight an awareness uh, perspective to our students. And then from there, if our students come forward and say, you know, this is a program that we need, I see some of our principals in the room, I know they always find a way to make it happen. And if they can't financially, then they reach out to us. Um, so I think that is the absolute first step here is just making sure that that is their, that awareness. And when we look at our schools across the county, sometimes we can look at programs and recognize there are more program representations in certain schools versus others. So again, I think the key point there is awareness. Um, I think we should go ahead and talk about the athletics piece, um, and then it, you know we can. Is Jeff here? Jeff, Dr. Sullivan, why don't you come on down? Welcome <laughs> come to the table. On down. <laughs> So yes, uh, that was a similarity there. <laughs> Dr. Sullivan, thanks for coming up. But I, I first just want to share, he, um, he will talk about this uh, more specifically, but I first want to say I'm so proud of our athletics program. I just have to start there. This year we have over 10,000 students participating in our athletics program. And I want to emphasize the importance of it because in so many different ways, we've talked about this during the pandemic, this is an outlet for so many of our students who are trying to figure out other things that they need to do and other ways that they can engage and participate and re-engage as a part of the community. And many of them find a way to do that through sports and athletics. Um, and so I, I, I say that number over 10,000 because um, coming into fall athletics and them taking into consideration so many recommendations and things that have been made. And I've seen it actually at schools where they've had so many students coming in to participate, they're finding other ways to engage them, even at the high school level, if they don't make a team. The staff is going above and beyond to make sure that this happens. Um, and so I, I just wanted to, to, to start with that. Um, now, I know there were some recommendations that came forward in terms of additional funding that's needed for athletics, and I think we have to continue to ground and center that in equity, right? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Sullivan to talk more specifically about some of the ticketing uh, processes and transportation that we have, but I also want to highlight this past year when we came back to school the first time, we had to do a lot of work to also make sure that these uh, events were safe and secure as we were re-engaging in ways that we had not for a period of time. And so we want to be very thoughtful in how we do that, continue to engage and take recommendations from our community. And I'd like you, Dr. Sullivan, to speak to where we are in terms of the audit and the process, because I want to be you know, very transparent in the things that we have done. Because sometimes we don't wait until the end of 
uh, a process to say this is a good idea, let's implement it. And I think you all are great examples of taking some of these things in consideration as we go. But just to highlight some of the work that we're doing in those areas, I think are really key. But I did want to elevate last year, um, not at this time, but more at Oct October, we were really talking about some things that we had to do in terms of processes and procedures to ensure we were also creating uh, safe environments uh, at events and such. Dr. Sullivan. Well, thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good afternoon to you, President Wolf, and the rest of the board. Uh, we're very excited. As Dr. McKnight mentioned, we have over 10,000 student athletes registered, 10,678 right before this meeting. Uh, so we're, we're thrilled, and uh, the season's going very well. I want to address the admissions concerns first. Um, we transitioned as many operations during COVID-19 changed. It changed the way we did business, if you will. Um, we changed the way we handle our admissions at events. We went digital. Uh, we rode the coattails of the State Athletic Association with a company called GoFan and started with digital ticketing. Um, and with that, we started in the fall postseason last year and continued throughout the school year, learning how that, through an equity lens, how would that impact our schools? And we knew from some other large school systems in Maryland, Baltimore City, Prince George's County, who had already gone there before us, we learned from some of their um, implementation uh, policies, and, and we were able to roll that out last year, and we're continuing with that. We're very excited about that. Um, it's made things very easy to allow student athletes to get into events. It's allowed our game administrators to know who's coming to that event, how many uh, fans are gonna be at that event, and to manage the crowd, uh, keep people out of the parking lot, get them into the stadium from a safety and supervision perspective. And that's key for us with the admissions. It's not just we're trying to make money. There is a fiscal component that funds the program here in MCPS, similar to other districts around the state and the country. But most importantly, the, the game administration and the safety and security piece of having that ticket, the, managing the gates, it has been extremely beneficial to us across all of our sports, uh, whether that's a huge game on a Friday night or on a Monday. And we know, and we have um, great collaboration with our system-wide safety and security and our police department, that all of our events, we have 10,000 contests a year, we think about safety at those events regardless of what the event is and have conversations around what that looks like, whether it's a Monday night, whether it's a Friday night or a Saturday morning. Uh, so the admissions piece is key. The other thing I'd like to say with the cost is we have kept this, the cost of season passes the same for over 20 years uh, for our students and for our adults. And like for this fall season, $18 uh, for that season pass. And so we've tried to keep those costs um, in check. And as well, we've um, allowed our principals um, and our schools to support students that, that have needs as well. So that's the admissions piece. Um, Okay, to transition the, to the transportation or? Okay. Um, yes, and I just wanted to highlight exactly what you said. When there are students in our schools who are in a particular circumstance and they need the support for their families and, and parents, and this is why I continue to emphasize community um, and the relationship building, it is that we actually want them to be able to say that, you know, I, I'd, I'd, I'd like to have this benefit for my parent to attend or whatever it may be, so that one, we're aware and we can support that student, not just in that aspect of receiving support for an additional person to come to a game, but in other ways we may not be aware of. It just brings an awareness to that. So I, I do want to say that's what I would say is not new for our principals and our school teams um, to do, to determine you know, what is best to meet the needs of the students and their families. Thank you. And for the transportation, um, for this will be the third school year, we have streamlined all of our buses and um, paid and funded those centrally. We did an analysis, uh, an equity and anti-racist audit of our program and our financial procedures uh, a couple years ago. And uh, three big things came out of that, transportation, field maintenance, and security. Uh, with the support of Dr. Smith, Dr. McKnight, and the board and funding, we were able to tackle those three big, th big items and uh, really has changed the landscape very quickly across our program. And I think so quickly, we've got to get that messaging out to our communities, and that's something we're reflecting on in our program. But specifically with transportation, all buses are being paid centrally, so it's a, a bus is available for any event. The issue is from 135 to 435, our buses are taking our students home from school. 
So we have to cater and we try with our game times to do that to the extent possible. But during that window, we can't access buses. Um, and so that, that causes some constraints. And, and we're, even when we're taking an early bus, we have to keep, we have to pull staff and students out of class time. Uh, and, and on the back end, sometimes that's causing uh, students to get home a little bit later. So there are opportunities for our parents and in some instances, students to drive uh, to a games, uh, to games and contests. Um, and that is something during the online registration process that we collect those preferences from parents and the consent uh, through that online process. Again, not trying to make it overly complicated, but also being very direct and simple with that line of questioning. Uh, so there is a balance, but I think the take home here is a bus is available if we need it. A bus doesn't always fit for that various sport or that circumstance, and that is a decision that the coach and the team and the parents make during the preseason. But we're, our messaging is we have buses available and our transportation department has been phenomenal in providing them for us. Thank you, thank you for that. I saw Dr. Daka next. Oh, thank you. Uh, it, I'm not talking about sports right now. I wanted to thank uh, the young people for being here, uh, the Beavers. And I remember when the new wing was put on at Poolsville and a very innovative program started there with robotics. The, the building actually had places where the students could put their materials mm -hmm. and uh, they designed it. I don't know whether it's still working, but I know that that's what they had planned to do. And of course, Caleb was uh, very refreshing to hear from. Yes. And you've already commented on that. And uh, about the food insecurity, uh, we know that that's a problem, it's, it's a concern. Uh, we have Education Foundation uh, for MCPS. They raise funds, uh, they get uh, sponsorships. They did uh, provide a huge amount of funding for the uh, students to be able to uh, have meals here. And Ms. Mondrowski's on their board, and she knows all about that. So I wanted to thank you all for everything, and, and thank you for explaining about all the things that happen with athletics, and we know how important they are. Thank you. Now, I saw your hand, Dr. Joftis and, and Ms. Harris, but Ms. Yeah. No, okay. I'm gonna go to Ms. Sylvester. Um, thank you. I, I um, listened to all the questions and comments, and obviously, uh, food security is very important for, I have one for you, Mrs. So just let me do food security. <laughs> <laughs> is very important to all of us. And so I want us to think about, we're saying that no child is gonna get turned away from a free meal if they come up and don't have the money for it. But if I am that child that don't, doesn't qualify for farms, how do I know that? Because um, I may not even approach the lunch line. Um, so let's just, think about how, we're, we're happy that we have a system in place that no child will turn, get turned away, but the parents don't know that, the community doesn't know that, the child doesn't know that. So I, mm -hmm. I don't, um, I want us to, to uh, take that into consideration so mm -hmm. that uh, that's a reality. Kids are not gonna come up to the lunch line if they don't have the money to pay for it. And so uh, we have a mechanism, we're not gonna turn them away, but it's a tricky thing to communicate. Yeah. And I think that uh, we need to be as transparent as possible. If we are saying we're gonna raise the money to cover this, then um, let's be transparent with the community about what they do have access to. I wonder if that could go out in a Thursday message to make sure. Is that the message that goes out mm. to the community? Mm -hmm. Yes. To let the community know that it is available? Yeah, that's a great idea, uh, President Wolf. We can actually include that in our things to know at following the board meeting because that's where we reiterate main points. Um, I will say that that's why we selected that as a full conversation item at the board table because we really wanted to bring the awareness of our uh, of, of this to our community. And we sent out notes after that meeting to reiterate it. But to your point, I believe the more that we can emphasize that, most importantly, um, in addition to our parents understanding that when our students come into the school building, for them to be reassured that you should still go through um, and, and try to obtain a meal if you would like a meal, regardless of whether you have that or not, will continue to be emphasized at the school level. Thank you. Could I just say one mm -hmm. more thing? I think maybe too, um, the back to school fair is an opportunity to 
uh, make that known to the public this coming weekend. So, sorry. Yeah, so it's just to be clear, if you don't qualify for farms, mm -hmm. uh, you will have to pay for your lunch. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have the money, no child will be turned away from a hot, the, the same meal that everyone is getting. So that's, that's correct. Yeah. I have to admit that it was only one person that asked me about uh, filling out the farms forms, and I did talk with you about this that it's not just online uh, that they do this. They do have a paper process, which we've always had in the past, but we're going to have to make that known to the parents, just as mm -hmm. you're saying, they need to know that we're not going to let them starve. And um, interesting to hear about the equity audit, and did the cost of attending the events come up in the equity audit? And second, maybe as a follow-up, you could give us some information about how many school or teams, I guess, actually do access buses given the challenge of the timing. So we're saying it's available, but if it's, they're not accessible, then they're not really available. Yes, yeah, so we can, we can provide that information uh, in terms of the amount of uh, the number of buses by school. We can work with transportation. We're working through the accounting piece of that on the back end now that everything has been uh, centralized, but we could provide that information to you so you can see the breakdown. What we were seeing you know, prior to the change was that schools in more impacted communities were taking more buses. So that cost was being put on the school and they, were, they had less money to spend on equipment and uniforms and other expenses. And that's just, that was not fair. And that's why we had to pull transportation out of the equation, which is what we did. Um, and so now it's an equitable service across all schools. And we can see um, there are certain sports, I can tell you, that don't access buses. You know, golf, for instance, swim and dive, just nature of the sport have not utilized buses. And I think back to drivers versus buses there are certain situations with practices that bus we we don't have the infrastructure to provide transportation for the practices so we align kind of the games and that logic into the game in the match mentality so there is a little bit of that as well okay did the audit do your equity audit reveal that the cost of paying for a ticket to watch a game is prohibitive we did not look at that specifically in terms of the actual cost I think our, our gate receipts annually last year were just over a million dollars for the program, and that money is kept at the local school level for, for their programs. And then the amount of central office funding, uh, it, to determine that amount, we use gate receipts and then school population with a farms component to then calculate how much additional funding we're giving schools. So that is part of it. So schools that do not bring in uh, the gate receipts are going to get more support in central office funding. So that's how we do that to, from an equity lens. In terms of the actual cost of the ticket, we have not looked at that uh, for, and had a, an analysis of that. Uh, we can look into what that would look like moving forward. Um, I think you know, with the, the $4 plus there's a dollar convenience fee, it's about $250,000 a dollar, if you will, right? If we were to take a dollar off, we would need $250,000 to fund the program. And that's how I would, I would look at that in terms of the impact, but in terms of the actual ticket cost, we did not look at that. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions for Dr. Sullivan before we let him go? Ms. Harris? Thank you. Yeah, just a quick, uh, two quick questions, I think, for you. Um, I've heard of, you know, the GoFan digital ticketing, and you just mentioned the, the which I don't think you called it a service fee, you called it a... Convenience. Convenience yep. fee, thank you. Um, so. In that way, have, have ticket prices actually increased by the use of the digital ticketing app with the convenience fee, or did we reduce the price of a ticket to allow the convenience fee to keep the ticket price the same? So we took, we eliminate, we used to have three levels of tickets, um, $5, $3, $1. We went to a universal ticket price of $4, but there is a convenience fee of $1, so that's in essence a $5 ticket. We did not make any adjustments to the season tickets themselves. We kept those the same across the board. Uh, so that, that's that change that was made. Um, so we can look at, again, the ticket price is something if we want to have a conversation from the budget aspect, we, we can we welcome that. And um, the, the season passes that you mentioned, the mm -hmm. $18, same price for 20 years, is that, are those, when a, when a parent 
I know this wasn't the case when my son was participating, but when a parent goes through the automated process to sign their student up for athletics, are they given the opportunity to purchase an, a pass at that point, or is it reliant on other sources of information to let them know that that's available to them? It's not something we incorporate in the registration process. Um, that's something after the fact, but we can look at advertising that as part of the registration, um, and we can make a note of that. Thank you. Um, and then the last question, so it was brought out by multiple of our um, uh, public commenters that about the issue of students driving students. And you've mentioned that, you know, when, is, when a parent goes online, signs, or parent or guardian signs up their student athlete, they're asked the screening question about what, what which um, forms of transportation to games do you provide for pre-approval for, and one of them is to be driven by another student. I don't think, now again, it's been a couple of years since this applied to me, that um, in that process a parent is asked, do you authorize your student to be the driver? And I think that's something that some of our commenters were raising is that we ask them what methods of transportation do you authorize, but for those students who are doing the driving, are we asking parents to confirm their, their permission for their student to be that driver, to provide insurance information and vehicle information? And if we're not doing that, um, is this something that would, could also be um, wrapped into the automated process that parents go when they are signing up their students for athletics? We can actually we can look at that and and see to what level of information, and, and we'll work collaboratively with other offices um, to to ensure that that's streamlined yep. to collect uh, information. I'm I'm happy to to have those conversations. Yeah, I think it's a, um, think an important liability been, safety issue, right there. Yeah, and I I completely understand that, and I think from a from an insurance perspective, I think we have utilized a similar form for uh, several years. And when we transitioned to an online registration, we took that opportunity to look at the information that we collect to streamline that in terms of transportation, and also make it not overly complicated for mm -hmm. parents because it is if you've registered, it, there is a lot. There's a lot of yes. information that we provide. And so we try to make it as streamlined as possible without overlooking things uh, such as you know, transportation or health and safety or just the overall permission and risk of participating. Yeah. So we can, we can look at that piece of it to see if we want to elevate the insurance and, and the language around it. Yeah. Um, happy to do that. Yeah, yeah I think, and I think our parents would be grateful to know that they are, they are being asked to, uh, to provide permission for their student to be a driver of other students. Um, but it's also, it, it's, a, it's a reassurance for, I think, for our system that we're keeping our eyes on that. Because we have all seen the reports of student drivers getting in post-event accidents um, after athletic competitions. So um, the, if we can provide some safeguards or some um, wraparounds to acknowledge that reality and take a couple of steps, I think that would be good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sullivan. We're going to move on now to item five. Dr. McKnight. All right, thank you, President Wolf. We are ready for the presentation of the day, opening schools. Um, I'll ask the teams to start to transition. And if we could pull the PowerPoint presentation up, please. I'd first like to say um, thank you. I know there were a number of questions that were on your mind based on public comment. Like, for instance, one, there were several testimony. It's OK. Thank you. We know we were in transition. Uh, there were some uh, questions raised around how we were doing with our return to policy with masking and such. And so we are prepared to cover that and all of the other items so that you have a very good comprehensive understanding of all the things that we've done to prepare for the opening of schools this year. Um, next slide, please. So um, as we kick off the, the PowerPoint presentation, I want to begin with the opening of the theme all together now. Um, just a moment ago, we were here talking about athletics, but there have been so many moving pieces to the preparation for everything that we're doing to prepare for the opening of schools. And I just want to highlight that every office, every um, so many community members have come forward even. And if I could just for a moment 
highlight, you know, this year we've started out discussing a number of things that were unique to opening school this year, like for instance, dealing with the labor shortage nationally and then also thinking about how does that impact us locally. Well, I have to say, I, 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 we all should sit here very proud of our community members. Um, here in this building, we do not have the Office of Human Resources, but we had a number of community members coming here and asking questions, what can I do to help? If you need substitutes, if, you, um, if I am certified in this area and I've retired and I'm willing to come back, I want to be able to come back to help. And I just use that as a point of, um, even though there may be challenges facing us as many other public school systems across the nation, it is our community that, that does stand as a, a, a pillar of strength for us during those challenges. And so I just want to publicly thank all of our community members who've come forward and say, what can we do to help the school system at this time? And I think it truly embeds the, the, the theme of all together now, which is what we said was going to be necessary for us to achieve the true success of the school system, and most importantly, our students who are in it. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, so um, I wanted to kick this presentation off reminding us of some really important elements that are not new to us and not new to our community, but it's important for us to continue to ground our work this year in the board priorities. Um, all of our work is grounded into the exact areas of our strategic plan, and you'll see them there. Um, you know, academic excellence, professional and operational excellence, and community engagement and well-being. Um, you know them, but I think it's important for us to begin all of our presentations and our work and priorities as a school system to continue to come back and reflect on why are we doing what we're doing and making sure that it is aligned to what we say is important for our students in our community um, and therefore should be relevant in the work that we do moving forward, including opening of schools. Next slide. So we want to speak to the areas in which we would like to see our school system make progress. When the strategic plan was implemented, we said that these were not just areas that we thought were personally important to all of us individually, but we wanted to focus in on areas that we would monitor and say, um, these are areas that we look forward to seeing uh, progress being made in our school system. And so there were sp specific things um, from our strategic plan that I just wanted to, to call out that you said were areas in which the board said these were areas that you want to see progress made in the school system. You called on us to focus on building a safe and inclusive school climate in every school. You talked about the importance of having two-way communication between schools and families to make sure families had that connection. Um, you talked about improving our staff recruitment, retention, and allocations to make sure that we had a uh, not only qualified and certified staff, but staff who understood the importance of caring for our children and so that that would become live in every classroom, given the impact of learning during the pandemic. And you also shared that a priority was ensuring our teaching and learning efforts are resulting in more student demonstrated lear demonstrating learning in mathematics and literacy. And I will say these areas will point on for us because um, as we have said, these are the areas that we want to pay attention to. We know that they have been data driven. We've been looking at the data over the past couple of years and really looking at, well, what's been the result of all of the uh, programs and things that we've put into place? And so uh, we want to continue to be accountable to exactly what that is. So we're opening this presentation up, and I wanted to share this with you because if you look at our um, contacts and roadmap for the year in terms of what we're going to be discussing in our board meetings, I also want you to see the alignment to us being accountable and coming back to say, these are the things that you've said are our priorities in the school system. Most importantly, you want to know what is the progress that we're making in these areas. And so as you look at this slide and you'll see um, uh, that our board presentations are playing out in a way to really say what is happening in our 210 schools as a result of these priorities. And this is exactly how we've established uh, how we're gonna have those conversations throughout this year. Next slide. Okay. And so um, today in our discussion, we're really going to talk about the readiness of the board priorities in all of these areas, which are areas that I just mentioned. Um, I want to share that um, you and our community are going to continue to be updated on these and initiatives that we implement throughout the year to address these areas. And most importantly, I wanted to say we are seeking to answer essential questions throughout our updates. And I wanted to share these questions with you because I want to start this year with these questions. And I want all of us to really think about how these questions are the constant questions that we're going to have to go back to no matter what is happening. The first is, uh, what is the program policy or practice that is uh, implicated? 
very interesting. We were just talking about a problem we were trying to solve, which is that students are not hungry who need food. We went right, we went right back to the policy. The board implemented a policy to address that particular issue. And so I raise that as an essential question because we have to always ask what is the program policy or practice that is implicated in the problem we're trying to solve. Next, how is the topic aligned with the board's strategic priorities? That keeps us on course. Third, what are the budget implications? So we're going to have that conversation throughout the year because when we get to discussing what the budget priorities are in December, we don't want that to be new information or new news to everybody understanding why the school system and the board is making the investments in the things that we are saying are important. The fourth uh, essential question is what is the intended outcome? We recognize that we can come and share initiatives and really good programs that make all of us feel good. But most importantly, more important than feeling good, it is what is the intended outcome we want for our students? Because that has to be at the crux of the accountability and how are we monitoring that? And then the others aren't new to you because we've been discussing these questions through, uh, over the years in Montgomery County. How will we know if we have achieved the outcome? And how do we know that we are on track to achieve the outcome? That's talking about progress. Even if we have not met the benchmark, what does progress look like and how are we defining that? And why is it happening? And if it's not happening, discovering why it's not happening. So when we think about those essential questions, um, I raise those to us because those have to be the questions that we keep in mind as we begin to talk about going into this year, um, continuing to make sure those priorities are at the forefront of what we're doing. And um, with that, I'm just going to say we are excited to kick this year off. We have 160,000 students coming back to us in the school system. And I point that out because it's important to note that approximately 1,700 students are enrolled now more now than we were a year ago. That's progress. And that says that our community has stepped forward. You believe um, in us regaining the trust within our community, and we're going to do this together. So we're excited to receive them. I am going to turn it over to the team because I know they want to get into the details of exactly what all these components are going to be. But I do begin this presentation with much uh, gratefulness for the Board of Education members and our community who have really, and, and the staff um, who are out there just working hard. They're in the buildings this week getting ready for Monday um, and doing it with so much excitement. And I'm just grateful that um, we have the team and the community who are committed to making sure our students have the most positive experience in kicking off this year because it is going to be a great year. Okay. All right. With that said, I'll turn it over to Ms. Edwards. Yes. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, as well as the board members. I will start by saying this is the most wonderful time of the year. <laughs> it is the <laughs> it is the start of the school year and we are excited to sit before you today to share with you the immense focus, the immense strategic planning and the work of staff on behalf of students, on behalf of staff within our buildings and the community to prepare for the 2022-2023 school year. We will be sharing with you our readiness this year through the lens of the board's priorities. You will hear about our work this summer around improving math and literacy rates, building safe and inclusive school climate, supporting two-way communication between, between schools and families, and as Dr. McKnight shared earlier, improving the recruitment, retention, and distribution of high quality and diverse staff. You will hear not only from central office staff, but we also have school-based staff here to share their perspective, their readiness, and what they look forward to this year. Next slide, please. At this time last year, we sat with great anticipation. We promised that we were going back five days a week and in person, and we did. Um, we did that with great anticipation of being back in the buildings and being around one another. What we did not know is that we would be operating in a teaching and learning environment with COVID-19. And so COVID-19 came with being able to operate our schools on a daily basis while still teaching our students, making sure we kept that environment safe and we had to live with COVID-19 while doing uh, teaching and learning with the overlay of operations. What that sounded like for us was contact tracing, 
rapid testing, test to stay. We experienced different things as we really looked at how do we maintain a teaching learning environment and provide our students in-person instruction. And so we're still excited this year. But as we go into the 2022-2023 school year, what you will hear from us today is our shift from heavy operations into, again, our renewed and continued focus on teaching and learning. And Dr. McKnight has said this on several um, times. We are a school system, and that's what we do. But we also know that we have to maintain an environment in which our students and staff are definitely safe and really focusing on our most precious commodity, our students. And so on the next slide, one of the things that was critical for us this year as we prepared, we formulated an opening of schools readiness team that combined every single department and division within the school system to really sit down and come together collaboratively and coordinate our efforts to prepare for this year. In terms of enhancing the work that we do in the communication, we provided to the board on a weekly basis just some updates around what it looked like in terms of our readiness in different categories so that you would know and that we were on track to hit that mark to open our doors on Monday. And so I do want to thank all of our staff who served on that team. We also had principals on that team as well, and it was a really a great experience and, and an honor to be able to prepare for our students. At this time, we are going to turn our focus over to looking at improving math and literacy rates and the work that we did for the summer. And I'd like to welcome and ask Dr. Peggy Pugh, our Chief Academic Officer, to turn the mic on to share um, information. Thank you for the cue. <laughs> Good afternoon, Peggy Pugh. Um, it's my pleasure to, to share with you how we've been planning to begin the school year. Next slide, please. Um, it was interesting to me to, to participate in the collaboration and in the coordination between offices. I learned things about buses. I learned things about food and nutrition. I learned things about what operations was doing, um, all in the context of what I took very seriously is my goal is academic excellence. So one of the indicators to improve is improving math and literacy rates. So looking at the, the strategic plan and then overlaying the board's priorities, we're really excited about what's been done this summer already to prepare for an opening of a successful school year. The plan is really what is done most of the time in the summer is professional learning for our teachers when they have time without students directly in front of them and they're able to really think through the content, the new resources that we have, as well as the use of formative assessments to make sure students are making progress. Next slide, please. So this image should not look new because this is a model of acceleration. It's an approach really to teaching and learning that um, is a, a purposeful focus on making sure every student has access to grade level instruction. Sometimes the tendency is to understand that there have been learning gaps and understand that students are going to struggle with the content, but it is extremely important that we keep our focus on making sure that our students at least have access to those grade level standards and that our teachers are prepared then to be able to see where those learning gaps are. You can, can't put together two years of, of, of learning in the way that we did in order to be able to back map and have students prepared to access standards. So that's not new, that's an ongoing focus, but it is uh, uh, something that we need to make sure we continue to emphasize with our teachers and leaders. Um, and, it, and that's hard because as a teacher, if you know your students haven't mastered previous skills in your mind, logically, you need to go backwards. So it's just a constant focus on making sure we uh, bring our, our students access to, to what is grade level. We also know that our instruction should be uh, aff affirming to our students. All of our students with the different racial, ethnic, and linguistic identities. Um, and the wor work should be worthy and engaging and meaningful and interesting to students to bring their lenses to what they're learning. These guiding principles for acceleration were the foundation for summer training and the instructional leadership meetings that occurred in schools. Next slide, please. As was shared with you last spring, um, the goal to improving math and literacy rates really starts early on with our earliest learners. I think it's critical to make sure that our youngest learners can read and access text early on. 
There was some work done to pilot the structured reading and the balanced literacy work last year, and what they found were excellent results. And so that program is expanding to all schools this year. We've learned through the science of reading that it takes a structured and balanced approach, a structured approach, excuse me, not a balanced approach. Sometimes those are two opposite things. Um, a structured approach uh, and systematic to teaching the foundational skills for literacy. Um, the team trained all of our kindergarten through second grade teachers in the science of reading and in the use of Dibbles, which is a new assessment tool, maybe not new, but a, an existing assessment tool that allows you to monitor and track how a student is performing in each of those areas in order to intervene very early um, for our youngest learners. This work was budgeted for and, and planned and purposefully supported through your strategic plan as well as through your funding of the resources that will allow us to implement this new program or this program this year. Additionally, we want to make sure that our students have uh, the opportunity to, to apply the literacy in their skills in their variety of the subject areas that they're in. It shouldn't be seen as we teach reading in one place and they never read in other areas. It's really important that we give them access to texts that are representative of themselves and of the challenging and interesting content that's available. At the secondary level in literacy, it's a similar focus, making sure that our students are continuing to be supported in learning uh, to read complex texts and to respond to those complex texts, but also then not just in reading, that they are accessing complex texts in other content areas within a cross-content focus in literacy. In mathematics, at both levels, um, one of the challenges of the states of the standards, the student performance standards, is that they are complex. They require students to be able to think and to respond through real real world lenses. And so it's not linear skill building. And it is application of skills to solve complex problems. So we know we still have work to do to work on understanding the content itself, the standards themselves, the level to which is it, the students are required to do the work to be able to be successful on those standards. So that work will continue to make sure that we have deep understandings of the standards as well as how to plan to help our students have learning experiences that get them there. Uh, the second piece is pro continued professional learning on what that actually looks like in the classroom. What am I doing with my students given their unique learning um, needs, skills, abilities, and how do I plan for that in, in, a, in a way that's manageable for our teachers. This year we're also going to continue to support for language development our emergent multilingual learners and continue to train staff on the use of the anti-racist instructional practices as we work together across offices to continue to develop a framework for equitable teaching and learning. Next slide please. The graph here shows the feedback received from staff who participated in professional learning over the summer. And what you'll see just in a big picture, the teal is this year's feedback versus the orange, which was last year's feedback. So the feedback is much more favorable this year. They've responded that they appreciated the uh, content and the impact that they saw on their future teaching. As of August 15th, over 9,500 staff completed over 12,500 courses, which is pretty significant on their days off. Two of the largest professional learning experiences offered this year included the Leader in Me, which is a social emotional learning um, component where we had over 4,000 staff trained, and then the shift to structured liter literacy for those K2 teachers that over 3,300 staff were trained. We're committed to improving our student math and literacy rates as we continue to learn evidence-based practices and look deeper at the data to find ev practices that are occurring in schools that are having an impact. Next slide, please. As part of our preparation um, and what we're sharing, we're excited to have school teams join us today because they're the ones who are actually doing the work with our students. I'm honored to introduce our first colleagues from our schools, and we'll welcome Principal Elisa Royal and Mrs. Rachel Mann, who is a staff development teacher from Oakland Terrace Elementary School. This incredible leadership team and their teachers celebrated their students' growth of 36 percentage points in mathematics last year. So we're excited to learn from them. 
thank you, Dr. McKnight and um, board for um, allowing us this opportunity to share a little bit with you about Oakland Terrace. Um, we are a special school because we are one of six TWI or two-way immersion schools as well. So as our students returned um, from COVID back to in-person learning, um, our leadership team really worked together to identify what the gaps were, what the needs were, um, and where we needed to start last year to really support our students. Um, and a couple of the key points that we decided is, one, we really need to understand each and every child as an individual, who they are as a learner, and what their gaps were. Um, as well, we determined that it, we needed to spend a lot of time at the beginning of the year understanding um, the type of learner that that child was so that we knew the best ways to impact and support and educate the children. Um, and so that's what we really did. Um, and Rachel is going to share a little bit about um, our planning methods. So I'm going to first start by talking about our quarter planning. So during our quarterly planning, teachers looked at the big picture and identified what skills and concepts the students needed to understand by the end of that quarter. Then teams looked at the standards and planned with the end in mind, anticipating potential gaps and misunderstandings, and then also determining which concepts would be taught in either English or Spanish, because we are a TWI school. We also looked at the required EOL assessment for that marking period to determine the highest priority standards. And then when we were deciding um, when to teach what, we wanted to ensure that sufficient time would be given to those high priority standards. At a weekly planning level, during weekly planning, teams identified what students should know, be able to do, and be able to say by the end of the week, going back to what you were saying earlier about the language piece, that's a huge focus at our school, the oracy and the language development. Teachers then broke this down into concrete skills that built upon each other and discussed strategies and resources that would be effective when teaching these skills. Additionally, during weekly planning, teams identified what formative assessment data would be collected to create flexible needs-based groups and then discuss the strategies that would meet the needs of each of these groups. Again, echoing what you said earlier, to help us ensure that all students were able to access the grade level standard. Because we are a two-way immersion school, there's also partner teacher planning. So the English facilitator and the Spanish facilitator are in constant communication about their students and their needs. So partner teachers also consistently met to discuss what strategies worked well the prior week and then incorporated those strategies into the following week. Bridging anchor charts were created by students and traveled between the classrooms to help make connections between English and Spanish. And this ensured that the instruction in each language built upon each other rather than being two separate entities. So that was what our processes were for our planning. But then what actually happened in the classroom right, with our students? So due to our schedule with TWI, we needed to be flexible with how both our literacy blocks were structured and our math blocks were structured. And we needed to be creative when meeting the needs of our students while still following the curriculum. As previously stated, we use daily formative assessments to create flexible needs-based groups and then provided differentiated instruction to meet the needs of the students in each group. We focused on vocabulary, oracy, and bridging to make connections between the two languages. And in both literacy and math, students worked with each other to explain their reasoning, allowing them to facilitate their own learning. And there's one more. Um, a few other pieces that we implemented last year, uh, we used our CARES Act um, to have a really focused after-school math program um, that used the curriculum and the standards, but in a fun, tangible way. So our students were able to work both in English and in Spanish after school, developing and continuing, continuing to develop their skills. Um, we used iStation, which is um, provided to the TWI schools from the TWI office. Um, which provides um, an online programming that gives independent um, practice for our students. And then our summer school program, which is also a bilingual program focused on um, literacy and math um, to continue to develop the skills for our students in both languages. Thank you. Thank you to Mrs. Royal and Mrs. Mann. At this time, we would like to turn it over to the board for questions and discussion. Does anybody have any questions at this time? Ms. Evans? Yeah. So this was excellent. Thank you so much. Um, the intentionality is very obvious. I love that. So talk, tell me a little bit about iStation again. You said it was online programming. Is it, it was, a, was a specific because of the, um, the two-way immersion? Yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Yes, yeah, so iStation um, is an online bilingual program oh that was provided to us um, two years ago when we went virtual. Uh, and then we continued it this past year. And so it's, um, teachers, um, we're using that um, with our students um, from, from K to second grade. Okay, thank you. I missed the bilingual portion. Okay, great. And you know, I have a quick question. Do any of our other schools use iStation? Do we know that? Good question. I think uh, we can. I apologize. Yes, um, we certainly can bring back that information. I saw that Miss Hazel came up. I don't know if we know how many, but Miss Hazel. Yes. Well, we can get the uh, numbers of schools for you, but all of our two-way immersion programs and some of our other language programs do have the opportunity to use it. Yeah, I figured. Mm -hmm. I just never heard of it before. I just wanted to ask that question, but thank you. Ms. Sylvester. Um, thank you so much um, for the entire presentation thus far. Um, I, uh, Principal Royal, um, I'm assuming that the things that you highlighted are what you feel have made the biggest difference in making the academic gains that you have, have made um, in the past year. And a question for Ms. Rubens is, um, again, we're always interested in system, not just fabulous school here, but um, if we were to go to the elementary schools across the system, how many would we see some of these promising practices? What are things that everyone is doing versus things that the creativity of this staff have implemented? So, uh, a fantastic question, um, Ms. Silvestri. I think key to our conversation yesterday Part of our collaborative work around teaching and learning and academic excellence between the programmatic side of the office and the school side will be how we're coming together coherently to take a look at those look for us. So right now, we've spent the entire summer bridging that alignment. You've heard about the professional learning that's happened. We're now looking at how staff development teachers who are a pivotal part of the budgetary component of uh, our district, the investment that the system has made in providing a staff development teacher at every one of our schools who are fully released, what their professional learning looks like using our learning achievement specialists, and then what does the learning for our school principals and leadership teams entail. And so we'll have two pillars along the lines of uh, leadership enhancement and school improvement processing so that there are some things that that we want to say to our schools, yes, these are things that we are expecting to see across the board so that we do reach that scalability and we're not bringing to you distinct schools who are doing great things, but we're scaling across the system so that the system's return on investment is evident in our student achievement outcomes. Thank you. Can I, I have also a follow-up question okay. though, just for Ms. Rubin to uh, Ms. Silvestri. Um, we have been, we haven't had this program very long, I know, and, and most of the time you've been in COVID, so I must say I'm very impressed <laughs> with your math percentage increases. So when will we expect an evaluation of the program in general across our schools so we can look to see where, where we can scale up and what's really working? You were reading my mind. That's what I was going to say. So uh, even though this is one school um, presenting today, when we do take a look at the evidence of learning data and schools that are making great gains, particularly amongst our emergent multilingual learners, two-way immersion schools are starting to rise to the top. And so we are uh, in the process of doing an evaluation with uh, Center for Applied Linguistics, or CAL. And uh, so they're working with us and the Office of Shared Accountability to take a look at the data and to do a formal evaluation. So we will be coming back to the Special Populations Committee okay. to share that information with you all. Thank you, I look forward to that. Um, Ms. Harris? Yep, uh, thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question for you, Dr. Pugh. Um, when you were talking about um, looking at the curricula that we're using at both the in literacy and math, elementary and secondary schools, and you know, we've committed as a system to our anti-racist system work and our diversity inclusion work, not only to make sure that students see themselves reflected in the in the people who are in their schools with them every day, but also in the content that is taught. So are, do we have a bit of a feedback loop? Because I hear from students saying, 
some of their courses, they do see that influence, that enriched in diversity and inclusion, but not all. Are, do we have a feedback loop built in for students to share with us when they don't feel like they're getting that piece, that inclusivity piece? Uh, I was here at a board meeting when I heard students speak to that, but I'm also excitedly waiting for the uh, anti-racist audit mm -hmm. because I think that was a huge vehicle for students to share their, their voices and should give us some insight on particular areas. It's usually about, um, in particular courses, the multiple perspectives mm -hmm. and how the content is delivered. So I think there will be continued work to be done on that. So that's the big picture. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yes, that is the big picture, but uh, our supervisors in a lot of our content areas, particularly uh, social studies and literacy, meet with students, particularly our student leaders, frequently throughout the school year to get that kind of feedback. So as we are looking to uh, evaluate um, our program and particularly update our resources, we are using that feedback. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Mrs. Royal and Mrs. Hahn, Man, this goes to you, I think. Uh, I'm fascinated to hear you were talking about using sort of daily and weekly formatives so that um, they can do flexible needs-based grouping. And so it sounds like that's, that's a very fluid way of grouping and regrouping students on an ongoing way. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and I think, I mean, that, that's critical, right? As a teacher, not assuming, but making decisions based on concrete data. Yeah. And it's, you know, what a student might struggle with one week, you know, the next week, it might be a concept that he or she excels with. Mm -hmm. And so rather than having set groups, set static groups, they are fluid and changing daily. Okay. Love Thank you. Yeah, fascinating. Mm -hmm. And um, just a quick quiz, so I, this goes, I think, a little bit to Miss um, Sylvester's comment earlier. So we have six TWI schools. Um, is there, do you all have like a, like a TWI PLC and you meet and chat and share and, uh, you know, brainstorm? Yes, absolutely. Um, monthly we have meetings um, and the principals are in contact all the time. I'm in the TWI office. Um, I think they're even coming to my school tomorrow. Um, <laughs> they are available all the time and have been a wonderful resource to us in our schools um, throughout the pandemic and now especially. Okay, that, that's amazing. And I'll, I'll apologize for the, all the acronyms. Um, we could use this as an opportunity to plug yes. <laughs> the MCPS acronym guide and just say um, this would be a great resource at the back to school fair and our back to school nights for parents because we are an acronym jargon heavy system <laughs> and this thing is 2022 and it's already outdated but you know having these available for families in multiple languages i think would be huge and you know the the print shop at stone street does such an amazing job with these so anyway love my acronym thank, you. thank, thank you. you very much dr daca yeah i <clears throat> Congratulations on the 36% increase, I guess, literacy and math. But how did you establish the base? <clears throat> what were you comparing? You know, yeah, just let me know that. So when we began um, prior to the students returning that summer, we used the like end of year test results to kind of identify the students that really needed support and extra supports. Um, and there's a leadership team um, determined what students really need specific, uh, maybe more targeted intervention and focus. Um, so, so just using prior um, MAP um, and MAP R, well, lit literacy would be MAP RF um, for K2, MAP R um, for three, four, five, um, and then just benchmarking ourselves from you know spring and then what, seeing if they had um, any regression in the summer, during the fall, and then winter, and then spring again. Thank you. Dr. Joftis, are you finished? Dr. Jaftis. Thank you. Um, and thank you all again. That was, that's awesome. Um, I think this is actually for Dr. Pugh. So um, it sounds like the focus of professional development this summer has been on structured literacy and leader in me. So this is a conversation Ms. Rubin and I have, have sort of been having. It, it seems like then by default that these are sort of the two what we're defining as being sort of the high leverage strategies for improvement, right? That um, because we're investing this time and energy in, in training our teachers around, is that fair to say? It's fair to say. Okay, so 
I guess my question then is there's one of the questions from of sort of our guiding questions is around like so how do we know that that's being those two since we're investing a lot we're believing that those are what's going to move us um, into new territory how do we know that that's going to be implemented successfully and that we're continuously providing that ongoing support thank you um, excellent question why invest in it if it's only partially implemented right. and i think we learned a lot last year uh, the team did about how to do the science of reading and how to do the professional development certainly uh, a one professional development in the summer is not going to help someone feel 100 percent confident with implementation so the continued coaching and professional learning is critical to the ongoing so we have to make sure and we're still hiring people today so we still have to make sure that those um, new people are, are trained and that our our staff development coaches and our vision between our offices is aligned so that what we're saying to schools is clear and possible so I think you can do both the wellness piece and I think you need to do both and it needs to be in an integrated way so I would say those are two of the strategies I think a third strategy is to make sure that we are clear ourselves in what we're asking teachers and leaders to do at a school and that it comes out and is and then we are able to support uh, that work um, I wanted to Dr. Doftus, I wanted to, to address a part of what you were saying to thinking about those two strategies, measuring how do we know whether they're being effective or not. Um, and so, and implement it. Right. So there are two areas that we're looking at that really will define implementation and the, the success of it or the uh, non-success of it. Uh, and one is to be able to collect, collect some uh, qualitative data on uh, how the staff sees this being appropriate or helpful to them in their craft. You know, that comes through a qualitative lens. Um, that's always the way that we've looked at professional development and knowing that that was going to be important of it because it needs to feel of value to people. The second part is being able to look at what is the um, impact on student learning. That's, that's the second part. And so being able to look at, for these high leverage strategies, collecting qualitative data, which is the perception of the impact on the practice ultimately for the teachers and others implementing, and then looking at what is the actual outcome for the students is exactly how we measure all of these leverage points. And I would imagine, only because I've been around Oakland Terrace for a while, um, a big part of it is, I know, and I can just speak to this from working with them over the years, um, their teachers are very much invested in the professional development and collaboration that they do with one another. If we were to walk into a building and say, as Central, we're going to require teachers to participate in the professional development, what I will say I've seen and witnessed at the school is the teacher saying, oh, we have to have this. This is a part of how we work. The work that we do together in our teams and our grade levels to actually implement these practices are really important. So that's, that's, that's investment for, from them. Um, and once we have that investment from them, we then can allow them to be able to capture the data on why these high leverage practices are important and how it brings meaning to their implementation. But then it has to say, the question then becomes, so what do we see happening with students? And I think their story says both <laughs> essentially lead to success in this case. So, and I appreciate that. Um, and again, uh, uh, Ms. Rubin and I had a, a conversation uh, yesterday, and this kind of goes to what uh, Ms. Silvestri was asking about, but I guess what I'm looking for more, I mean, what improvement science teaches us, right, is more on this idea of if we've got one or two things that we've invested heavily in that we're not only getting sort of that qualitative perspective data, which is important, and the impact on student learning, which is obviously critical, but that we've also got some level markers of implementation. So we've got a great model, right, of, um, of implementation. And so how do we define the indicators of implementation? And I'm talking like two or three, right? So maybe it's that all teachers are um, using the um, uh, flexible um, grouping, right? To me, that's an indicator that we need to be looking at right away, because it's a tough thing to do. Like what you're pulling off is an amazing thing, right? So how do we make sure that if that's one of the critical success factors for making this happen, how do we know that, th I'm just using this as an example, maybe there's another 
better indicator, but how do we know that flexible grouping is happening in schools as we're scaling it and making sure that we're getting them supports so that we know that if we're not making that happen, that we shouldn't expect to see the kind of outcomes that you all are getting later in the year and just being very strategic around around that. And I just, Thank you. You can, you, oh, oh. go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. At the risk of stealing my own thunder, because we are going to, <laughs> jokingly, um, we are going to talk about leader in me, but I do feel like the implementation markers there will be around the, the implementation of the MTSS, which is that multi-tiered student support system, where we'll be able to track that, and I'll get a little bit more into detail. And I think part of the professional learning this summer around how we create that look for us when we're going into school what are we looking to see in reference to the application and I think we have in our in our conversations talked about that application gap as a way of how do we create that rubric that system that allows us to gauge that throughout all of our schools thank you and I'm sorry one last question and then I'll stop I'm just curious if, if you all in doing such an amazing job of, of implementing again what's a very difficult thing to pull off um, if you sort of consistently are tracking the, the number of your classroom, t the number of your teachers who are doing that successfully on like a daily or a weekly basis, I assume the answer to that is yes, right? Uh, tra do we have the actual numbers? And no, no, but we no. do. We have established a school-wide look for. Yeah. So when we do team walkthroughs, those are the pieces that we look for in our students' um, academic program every day. Okay, you want to continue? We do want to thank the Oakland Terrace team, Dr. Pugh and Ms. Hazel for sharing with us around um, uh, teaching and learning and it was perfect for us to start off that way. As we transition and thank you board for your questions and discussion, we will be moving on to the next priority of safe and inclusive uh, school climate. Um, and here we will take a look and hear from Dr. Kapunin, uh, Ms. Rubin, myself, and then one of our school teams from Magruder High School as well. So good afternoon, board members. Um, Dr. McKnight and to our community members watching from at home. My name is Rochelle Rubin. I am the Chief of School Support and Wellbeing and here and excited to talk about the opening of schools and how we will create safe and inclusive school environments for all of our students. I think it's so important that we, we certainly began with the academics and think when we think about our district and the work that we've embarked on around uh, well-being and safety and security, actually leading the nation and putting behind our um, our work, the actual investment, the budgetary investment to ensure that when we say that student well-being is not separate from academic student outcomes, that we actually have the structures in place to, to make that happen. And so we're excited to, because this part of the presentation really builds on some of what you've heard already about that academic excellence, and we will unpack for you now how does that look like, right, so that students enter into each of our school buildings feeling safe, accepted, um, in their full humanity? And so we will talk about this through the lens of wellness, health, and safety. Next slide. So when I think about uh, wellness, I, I, we thought that the best way for us to really enter into this conversation is to take a look at the extensive and intentional work that has happened at the International uh, Enrollment Office in creating a wellness center. So the district put into our budget the investment of a newcomer coordinator, which was a fantastic collaboration, I don't know if you recall, between MCPS, HHS, and the County Council when we talked about how do we create a system where our agencies are connected around wellness 
wellness for our students. And certainly as we've experienced growth across our county, welcoming in a variety of new students and families to our county, how do we ensure that that's done in such a way that they have a platform, a jumping off place to begin with that's solid, that's supporting, that's nurturing. And so we had some challenges in that space earlier that the board called our attention to, that community members called our attention to. And not only did we back it budgetarily, but we also put in place the infrastructure to support a welcome center. And this is just the beginning of this great work uh, where we will be able to really take a look at giving our students a, a, a concrete way to begin well in our system. And I do want to take a moment to thank, if you look around the boardroom, uh, the team that's responsible for much of the work that you will see here today and the appreciation that goes out to them for what they've put in. So when we think about the international admissions and enrollment, over 500 of our staff members trained on trauma-informed practices, how to really welcome in students, how to give them that opportunity to connect with their new schools and their community and meet the needs of those families. Our parent community coordinators have continued to be instrumental in this work. Later you'll hear a little bit more about their work with Parent View, our collaboration across office and ensuring that not only are we offering trainings for our parents around Parent View, but within the languages that they speak. And finally, when I spoke of some of the challenges that we experienced, you'll see here, we've actually created a data system that has allowed us to engage increase our student enrollment in international enrollment and admissions by 50 percent and I will just say I, I, I don't think you got as many emails this summer as <laughs> as last and I think that's that's Ill illustrative of the work that we've done intentionally and you can see how our, our numbers look there from 2021, July and August, to currently uh, now, 2022 and 2023 for our school year. And so the parent view and synergy connection has allowed us to really process uh, in a meaningful way and get our students into the school buildings and enrolled. Uh, so next slide. So as we think about the important factors of um, safety and inclusiveness in our schools, we also are partnering very closely with our new chief medical officer, Dr. Patricia Kapunin, and she'll walk us through the health intersection of this work. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Patricia Kapunin, and uh, as uh, Ms. Rubin mentioned, the health and wellness of our staff and our students is absolutely critical for a safe and inclusive environment and, and really a precondition for being able to renew our focus on teaching and learning. I am thrilled and honored to be able to bring my medical expertise, experience in community health, and clinical operations leadership to this mission. Um, and I'm going to start by highlighting some of the other partnerships we have with the Department of Health and Human services. You've heard um, a little bit already about international student admissions, but we coordinate with them. They're our public health authority as well as our partner in providing student health services in our schools, but also many health services and supports outside in our larger community. So in terms of strategic planning, um, not just for COVID-19, but maybe other pu public health threats and uh, population health uh, missions that we may have, um, and in addition to our school-based health services, uh, the very important task of uh, school immunizations, childhood immun immunizations, not just COVID immunization is just critically important for protecting child health and something that for generations uh, has been a proven um, population health measure and something that all pediatricians are a little bit worried about as there has been missed care during the pandemic. Um, District-wide coordinated crisis response and health and wellness special initiatives that target not just our students, but our staff who keep our, our school community going. Educa educators, uh, administrators, other leaders, and the staff that provides their expertise on so many levels to keep our kids safe uh, and to ensure uh, their education. Um, and two other things that I'll point out are that these are all collaborative efforts. So partnership, not just with DHHS, but strong internal partnerships like our school readiness community and the community partnerships we have with our most important stakeholders. All of this takes a village. So I'm showing you a bunch of different things just to show you that it's not just about COVID. It's about a comprehensive uh, health strategy for our school community and everybody works together um, towards this mission. So I'm happy to join as a medical officer, uh, but happy to partner with with everybody. Uh, next slide, please. 
I will talk about COVID just for a little bit. <laughs> um, so one guiding principle uh, is that COVID specific mitigation strategies that we've heard a lot about uh, in this pandemic and had important testimony about today from our community have to have to be layered on a very strong foundation of core health strategies. So really good infection control that we've been more intentional about. This morning, I was talking with Principal Starr from the Longview School and she was sharing that there are so many things that we have started to do that we just need to keep on doing things that we weren't intentional about how we uh, uh, manage for example uh, tactile learning tools and how we sanitize them there are so many things that we've learned that we can continue to uh, practice to protect our community from infectious disease in general not just COVID-19 um, the uh, systematic and intentional attention that we have uh, that we have spent on ventilation and our air quality, the way we systematically clean and disinfect our schools, these are all a strong foundation of core health that we will be doing all the time for good infection control, uh, as well as teaching our children healthy habits, right? Covering your cough, that stuff never expires. <laughs> Washing your hands, and most importantly, staying home when you're sick. So all of this happens on, all of the COVID stuff happens on this good foundation of infection control that we've been very intentional and systematic about and that we will continue to engage in to protect our school community. Next slide. Um, on to COVID specific mi mitigation strategy. So on top of this very strong foundation of infection control, uh, we need to be flexible and intentional about this multi-layered process of different strategies that can flex to changes in risk, both locally and on a broad level. Um, uh, implementation of these measures, especially broad implementation, needs to take into account many different factors. So we had great testimony today from Mr. Thess and Mr. Thomas and the MCCPTA on universal masking. So I'll just take a moment to address that. Last year, we spent $12 million in COVID mitigation supplies. And that's not just counting human effort. 4.7 million was on masks alone. So that uh, effort was reimbursable by federal funds, but I share it just to demonstrate the scope of this mission, right? A program of this size must be managed equitably, responsibly, with transparency to the community. A program of this importance must have defined and measurable outcomes that are meaningful to everybody. Uh, a program of this importance must be nuanced uh, in terms of how we are able to uh, decide when certain strategies are important, both locally and both broadly. Uh, one thing that came out in our uh, input from our community today is that even at medium and low risk levels, there are gonna be situations that we need to define and hold ourselves accountable for in which masking and testing are gonna be recommended and required. And even when the community risk level is medium, um, there are gonna be situations that we need to recognize early and say, this is when we, uh, strengthen our recommendation or start to require a certain mitigation strategy. So it's not an all or nothing <laughs> decision. Uh, this is a complex program in a large system in which we need to define more specific levers for how we use these strategies at every level and not just broadly with broad mandates, but also in a more focused way, even at the lowest uh, levels. Um, if that makes sense. And I'll point out just a couple of things because I know that the CDC updated recommendations which we received about a week and a half ago are hot in the news. Um, vaccination remains important. It's not on the slide, but it is a proven way vaccinations and boosters to reduce severe disease and the overall burden of COVID-19 to a school community. Um, but on top of this, we have good guidance in terms of how we manage cases and respond to outbreaks that come from CDC, MDH, and the MSDE. You've heard a lot about uh, quarantine um, being discontinued and what that really means is that vaccination status is no longer a consideration when we're managing testing, masking, um, and isolation or management of actual cases. It doesn't mean vaccination's important, but vaccination status is not considered when we're looking at these other um, types of measures. Um, and uh, in terms of uh, testing, uh, the fact that the CDC has uh, not recommended universal screening for everybody does not mean that testing is not still important. Only that we need to be strategic about it and really more thoughtful about what our high risk situations are. Um, 
you know, I'll close, and there's more to come. <laughs> so in our recovery guide, we put out a base plan. But, you know, in medicine, we talk about implementation science, which is the space between a vaccine and a vaccination. Uh, and this program is large, and this community is large. So this implementation and the details of this implementation, Dr. McKnight has tasked me to do more detailed analysis and planning so we can be accountable and transparent to the community. So that is what to is to come. Uh, COVID-19 has not left us. We are thrilled to be able to renew our our focus on equitable teaching and learning. Um, but we have more tools than ever to help us be preemptive, proactive, and prepared. Uh, and with that, I will turn it back to Ms. Rubin, who will talk a little bit about contingency planning. Thank you, Dr. Kapunin. So key to what we hope, uh, next slide that you're hearing from us is, um, infrastructure, alignment, return on investment, and then certainly impact. What does it mean for our students and why? And so as we think about the health and wellness component and how this uh, plays out, as Dr. Kapunin said, uh, COVID-19 has not left us, certainly ensuring a safe and quality teaching environment for all of our students. So our contingency plan for schools remains intact. We were able to develop that last year where we have a concise staging of what happens should we face uh, circumstances that change. And that stage one is essentially school return is, continues as normal, five days a week in-person learning for all of our students. Our stage two involves individual schools going to virtual. Uh, we've developed an entire database that allows us to look across our system from what's happening inside the classroom at that teacher level to transportation. We then have a process where we work with our schools, directors, associates, uh, chief, all of us working together to determine, well, what do you see on the ground and does anything need to change if we need to move to a virtual platform? And then finally, that stage three, which if there's a system-wide reduction of capacity, what we need to do for that. So we've built this in into our everyday working mechanism so that there is no need for us to interrupt teaching unless there's absolutely something that calls for that. Next slide. And finally, um, as a continued part of that build out, our out class resource, and this is something that I'm hoping we will continue to build out as we've gotten much positive feedback, um, allowing the resources, the academic and instructional resources to be available videos, et cetera, in an out-class platform, um, certainly where students are able to access that information. And so with that, uh, another part of our wellness has to do with nutrition. So at the next slide, I'll have my colleague jump in. Ms. Edwards. Thank you, that, yes, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, as we continue to think about the wellness of students, and we heard a lot of testimony today and the board opened up conversation as well, we know that food is a critical component. We do service our students through breakfast, lunch, and, and supper, and we have been on a campaign this year to be able to collect farms applications from our families. So just overall, we have gained about 14,571 farms applications this year in comparison to last year at this time where we had about 8,900 applications. And then the previous year at this time, we were at 4,800 applications. That's critical for us um, from the standpoint because we have really leveraged our community partners, working with our PCCs, PPWs, as well as our principals. And we will be at the back to school fair as well, being able to promote that opportunity. In addition, um, uh, we continue to identify farm students through direct certification in the Medicaid match pilot. So that is another entrance point for us to be able to gain that information. One new piece I do want to highlight for the board, if you take a look at the screen, you'll see a small space where teriyaki, edamame, and broccoli noodle bowl. We have some new options that are coming forward this year. And these were just feedback from our students through tastings that we've done across the county. Our goal with this, we want to have signage that's available for students to be able to see. It shares with them the different food groups that they're getting because around food, it's just not about eating it, but it's about the nutritional value. And yesterday we were in a session, it's like, it's cool to eat good food now. So we want to make it fun, but it's 
it's really based on that feedback. So this is signage that will be available in all of our buildings that students will start to see. And it's a conversation that we can start to have as they actually enter into that space. The board also highlighted earlier a policy, policy JPH, um, which um, talked about how we will look at meal debt forgiveness and really being able to open the opportunity to, to offer meals and full meals to students who may not have funding and or um, may not have applied for free and reduced meals. And so as we continue our quest and really focus on student wellness this year, you've heard about COVID-19 and our work with DHHS. In addition to really thinking about how meals play a significant role in this component. And uh, Ms. Rubin will share next in terms of how we have worked with our social workers this summer to really gear up. This was a key component that we talked about during budget season that was really important to be able to provide social workers for our schools as well as other areas to really gear our staff up to be able to support the community through the lens of wellness. Thank you so much, Ms. Edwards. So if I can have the next slide up, please. I think everyone is uh, familiar with this graphic that we've used to really highlight the significance of mental health and social emotional well-being and safety and security. Next slide. And so this was a distinct investment, and I can't really say enough about the work that this team has done. Um, certainly, I, I feel the need to just give a big shout out to Ms. Shauna K. Jarambi, who has really led the effort around the social work in our system in Montgomery County Public Schools. All five of our 25 high schools have an assigned social worker. They engaged in extensive training this summer around trauma-informed care, restorative justice, social uh, outreach network, partnered with HHS. They have a big binder, if any of you would like it, that she <laughs> provided me. I've been reading through it. It's excellent about the training that's occurred. Having um, that social worker leader to talk about hours and how we continue to build out this work in our system. And then not to mention the coupling of that with the new MTSS platform that will be built that will allow us to track through Synergy, though the implementation, excuse me, of supports, as well as what happens when it doesn't work. What are we doing for our students? Being able to identify those students and really being able to put that data side by side with academic data to understand fully who are our students that need that extra support and what we need to do to provide it in our school system. Next slide. And so we, the leader in me, social emotional curriculum, um, you've heard about our discussion to really bring about coherence with this. And so in listening to some of the feedback we received throughout the year from teachers, uh, board members, you, you were well versed with teachers having some concerns around the curriculum itself. And there's been extensive work done all summer long around how we can improve this to meet the need using distinct feedback that we received. So the team has worked side by side with MCEA stakeholders to make substantive, substantive changes and revisions to um, the, culture, the lack of cultural proficiency, which was highlighted in that particular curriculum. Collaborate, collaborated with shared accountability to really take a look at how we will evaluate uh, the implementation and what students are getting out of this particular curriculum. Uh, a focus, just to give you an example of some of the things that were included, looking at uh, using appropriate gender identity. Um, the inclusion and highlighting um, acknowledgement of LGBTQ plus uh, families and experiences and voices and a variety of other ways in which the curriculum was analyzed. As you can see, we've made great progress in our district in terms of how many of our schools that cohort one has already gone through, cohort two now, and then our final cohort will cover our entire district, all 209 of our schools in the district trained on this, and it isn't the only options that schools have, but it is one that we will look to refine to ensure that every child has access to some level of social, emotional, proactive support instead of reactive where we're looking at how do we address an issue, how do we stop it before it even begins. And so at this point, we're going to turn it over to our safety and security component of the safe and inclusive schools. 
So our approach to safety and security this year is really built on a lot of the Sorry. <laughs> Our approach to safety and security this year is really built on a lot of the feedback that we gained last year. Feedback from our Triple SW. We also have feedback from multiple stakeholder groups as we went about building the CEO 2.0 MOU. And you'll hear uh, today more about what we've implemented and what we hope for for the future. And then, of course, the collaboration with SWAG. We also have the data that we have from our schools. We also have the feedback that we've received from our community. And what we do know is that last year, some of what Ms. Rubin shared was that we were presented with some social emotional components that our students output within our school community. We come to this together looking at wellness, but also the safety within the school spaces. So we are approaching safety and security within our schools through three lenses, being proactive, being preventative, as well as being prepared. And so a lot of what you will hear is how we have prepared for the summer to come into this school year. And one of the key components, um, especially as we were going through the budget season yes, last year, was really thinking about the staffing and the needs that were needed within those particular areas. We have increased staffing within safety and security in a couple of areas at the central level. Our cluster security coordinators who actually support each of our different clusters, we've gone from six to nine. And in going from six to nine, that's decreased their caseload from 35 to 24 to be able to have a, a more, um, a larger presence within those locations, increase the response time, and really build those collaborative relationships and work side by side with many of our schools. In addition, we've been able to hire 12 rovers, and that's new for us as a district. Our rovers will support our elementary schools where we don't have security assistance in those locations, and they will be able to build relationships with students, be able to support many of the needs that we were hearing from our elementary schools last year, and have someone that can be on site without taking away from the secondary schools. These rovers will also be able to support if we have an additional need at any of our secondary schools, but we saw this as a key enhancement to the work that we do and being able to support many of the needs that we heard last year. Last, year, um, last week, Dr. McKnight um, was with the city of Rockville and really looked at the gun buyback program, and that's a proactive measure in terms of really thinking about, again, going back to how we have different programs and how we are looking at putting structures in place to support the needs of our schools. And this summer, um, and being able to implement the CEO 2.0 MOU, there were a couple of things that we did that are really novel. We brought our CEOs, our school-based security team leaders, and our principals together, and we did concentrated training. We did training based on restorative justice. We focused on equity. We focused on things that went beyond the basic components that we usually focus on around security because it had to be about the student. We wanted to make sure we had the inroads about the students and we were being responsive to much of the feedback that we heard in this room and we heard a lot at the end of the spring about what are the things that we put in place to really think about the needs, the biases that might be there, and then really not looking at how we are, are um, really profiling students of color and or students who don't have English as their first language. So we saw this as a good platform and an opportunity to really think about the responsibilities of each one of those areas. In addition, in terms of being preventative, I talked about the elementary school rovers, they go into both categories, but we must be prepared. And that's a key factor in terms of being prepared should we have an emergency situation in any of our schools. So we've established our incident command structure so that we have <laughs> there you go. We're not we're not enacting incident command, just so you know. But we are prepared <laughs> to do so. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> no, 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 no worries. Um, but it gives us one a level of um, sameness across our buildings in terms of training our staff of what to do should we be in an emergency situation, and we have to move into a lockdown situation. 
aligned with that, we are working with MCPD on an MOU to institute a key fob so that our police department will have a key fob to get in our buildings. And that was something that came up um, on the heels of Uvalde, Texas, and we see that as a key component. And lastly, um, over the summer, there was specialized active shooter assailant training for MCPD SWAT. And I know this sounds like, wow, this is exciting. Wow, this is exciting, but it provides us a level of um, one um, training that the SWAT team will have. They know the layouts of our buildings. They're being able to communicate with our staff. Um, and in addition, it gives the practice, should we ever need to, again, being prepared, enact this within our school building. So this summer has really been about putting the structures in place, training our staff, and throughout the year, we will continue to gain information from our security-based staff and our principals to see what the needs are, as well as continue to monitor the data and be, be nimble within this particular area that has been so critical, but do it in tandem in terms of with wellness. Um, for this, we did bring our school team from Magruder to the table today, um, Dr. Lee Evans, um, as well as his security team leader, Ken Nelson. We thought it was important that you hear from both, primarily because they experienced the training this summer, the CEO training with the team leader as well as the administrator. But the other part is not one does this alone when we think about school safety within the building. The administrator, as well as the team leader, staff, and students all work together. So with that, Dr. Evans, as well as Mr. Nelson, thank you so much for being here today. And I turn the mic over to you. Well, thank you, Ms. Edwards, for that wonderful introduction. And uh, good afternoon, President Wolf, members of the board, and Dr. McKnight. I certainly do appreciate the opportunity to be here and share a few thoughts around uh, our preparedness, not only as a school, but perhaps what I've witnessed as a school system when it comes to school safety and security. And I believe, like many of you here, that school safety and security is, is the paramount concern, especially if we are going to look at maintaining, creating and maintaining you know, academic excellence for the growth and development of all of our students at every grade level. So inherent in that process, uh, and I, I believe Ms. Everett's talked about this in terms of prevention and preparation, but for us, and we had a process in place, you know, prevention, intervention, and ma tr uh, trauma maintenance. And when we had the incident at Magruder, of course, we were prepared in many ways. And I would just suggest to the board and, and also to the larger community not to perseverate on the perception of negativity with this because a whole lot more things happened that made that a successful operation than many people would know unless you were there. So I think that there's, we have a lot that in our school system that we're working on. The conference this summer certainly was, a, was an excellent first step in bringing together those resources and galvanizing certainly around human resources and looking at the training that we had at Magruder and Silver Creek uh, Middle School. Those were excellent steps in terms of putting us and law enforcement in a position to better respond to these emergency situations and what seems to be proliferation of weapons in our society. And so this is enormously frightening in many respects when we look at Uvalde, but we don't have to uh, go to Uvalde. We can go all the way back to Columbine, Parkland, and, and, and Newtown, all of these were uh, warnings to us as to what was on the horizon. And of course, Columbine was so long ago and far away, but it is important and incumbent upon us to look at these factors as we prepare, as we try to prevent, and as we try to uh, provide you know, maintenance to the trauma that our students and staff experience. And for me, that was almost immediately following this incident, and I, I met on a weekly basis up until the end of school with Ed Clark and Dr. Connolly Chester to find out how, what I could do better to uh, work with the social emotional well-being and after effect of this incident with our students, but also moving forward for the next several months and closing out school as well as with security because we obviously missed something. 
when you have a ghost gun and a targeted shooting, we're preparing for something very different with the shooter on campus. So in looking at that and taking advantage of every opportunity and to learn from that, and, and a lot was learned in terms of communication. Communication uh, to uh, parents especially. And I think that that for me and for my staff who perform marvelously, I think, in that is having a team that can respond without instruction in the emergency situation is, is, is not only a resource, but it's a gift. And so, but looking at this, there's some things we need to do and need to do much better in terms of communicating with our parents so that they fully understand and trust that every effort is going to be made to secure the safety of their children when they come to our schools. There's a lot left to do. Uh, and using the uh, human resources as we did with the conference at Walter Johnson, and certainly communicating with every principal at every level because they know better than anyone what the daily operations in their schools involve. So those are two key communities, parents and principals, that I think we need to really galvanize some support and strategies. The other thing I would submit in the time that I have left uh, is to examine uh, the technology that's available that's going to put us in a better position to do this work in the best possible way. So I think given that and, and uh, looking at what we have done, and I would again say you know, we've done an awful lot. We had one incident where in the school where it was a shooting that took place in the years that Montgomery County Public Schools has existed. And in spite of some of the negativity and the undercurrent that exists, I think that there's an awful lot to feel good about. And moving forward, we have to keep those things in mind and build on what we've already done and learn from you know, the things that didn't go as well. And there's some things there. So I would just simply submit to the board that while you know, we have something left to do and there are gonna be some difficult days ahead, we ought to look at the things that we do well. My student will be coming back in, the, in uh, August to go to school. And we met with his, with his mother and his grandmother and there's some cautious optimism there. And she liked, we had to set up a special schedule for her son, but she appreciated what was done, um, certainly by the school staff, but moving forward, what we were willing to do to put her in a much better position and in terms of what she felt about the education of her child in Montgomery County Public Schools and Magruder specifically. So having said that, and talking about that student, I will turn it over to Mr. Nelson, who was chiefly responsible, along with our school nurse, for saving this young man's life. Good afternoon, Dr. McKnight, board members. Um, I want to first state I apologize for any slight hesitance. I don't like to be the center of attention, especially amongst the uh, group here before me. But I'm here to speak. Uh, basically on the impact of the new training and how I think it's going to affect Montgomery County community as well as the system at large, as well as the implications that the training have on our jobs directly. I believe that the new training for MCPS security members will now be a more proactive and understanding student behavior, health, and well-being, allowing for more transparency while interacting with all stakeholders. I see this as a positive impact because staff of MCPS security now have the tools to better understand the current state of mind of students, staff, and the community. Some of these tools that we use or um, put in place after the incident took place was additional infrastructure assessments. Uh, we now currently have a front foyer greeter, monitor, and someone that monitors the cameras throughout the entire school day on a daily basis. We've added additional camera placements in areas that were not previously recorded or captured throughout a school day. We are put forth a request for additional PA system around the entire building and not just in key office areas. We've also had uh, addition of a golf cart uh, to allow us to conduct a proper and complete assessment of the school property, not just what's inside the building, but its exterior, its boundary, its tree line to the communities in close proximity to the school. After the after action report was submitted, we also um, took advantage of the training that was provided, such as the behavior threat assessments, um, allowing us to have a more in-depth understanding about what takes place with our students as well as our staff. Um, we learned um, 
better understanding for de-escalation training, social media awareness and handling, as well as many other trainings that were provided over this whole year. In regards to the implications of the training, um, one of the things we found out was regarding the recent security training sessions that have been taking place within the MCPS since the incident back in January, they have been invaluable. The training has brought awareness, accountability to every aspect of the job. Some of that, as I indicated before, was tracking threats across social media platforms. This allows us to look at images that are shared among students with the staff to allow us to look at certain visual uh, pictures to allow, is there any uh, safety issues that we may see within those items? It allows us to dig deeper into that. Assessing all factors of social media, um, emotional health and well-being, understanding issues in and outside of the school system, what's taking place at home. How are students arriving from home and what are, what are those issues? And it also allows us uh, the ability of building a stronger position of trusted adults within staff, students, and the MCPS community. The training conducted by the Montgomery County Police Department at Magruder High School <coughs> has given me a peace of mind and a sense of security. I know that the next time such a situation ever repeats itself, not only will it, not only will help me on the way, but those arriving will have a complete layout of my school, allowing them to assist with quicker response time, which is in turn allows us to expedite a smooth parent-student reunification. I also plan to use every tool provided during the past week to have a more robust safety plan with, which will allow my security team and I to remain consistent in our procedures while we build relationships with staff and students. It has shown us that with a proper mindset and vigilance, we could all come together for the betterment of the students, staff, and the MCPS community. Thank you. Thank you, Team Magruder. We appreciate your presence um, and your perspective. And so, board, we will finish out this section here around safe and inclusive uh, uh, schools by focusing on facilities. Um, and just to give you an update on facilities on the next slide, we did perform approximately 240 construction projects this summer. Um, I am pleased to announce that we did add one beautifully designed and wonderfully led school so that we go from 209 to 210. And to uh, say it like our principal says it at the school, the Harriet A. Tubman Elementary School. Um, very happy to open that school and that has space for about 670 students. And we did a complete reconstruction at Odessa Shannon Middle School. So those are our, uh, Odessa Shannon is a new building, Harriet Tubman is brand new to us. In addition to preparing for the coming year, we did focus on air quality to go back to some of what Dr. Kapunin shared regarding COVID-19. And we begin this school year meeting and or exceeding those federal state guidelines related to air quality in schools with some high efficiency filters in all classrooms and approximately 700 air cleaners throughout the district. What I am excited to bring to the board today, and we have this later in consent items, This we have a consent item that will allow us to monitor the air quality in every single one of our classrooms. This is new for us, but it brings a level of safety, health, well-being, and wellness into our school buildings that we have not had before. And this was a real partnership from work with our parents as well as our communities and our students. Um, we will have that hopefully rolled out no later than October. Um, the last component just to bring about our facilities is we have um, debuted a new work order system which increases our transparency, our work with the communities, as our work with schools. And this will give us an opportunity to be able to track response times, see what's coming in. Um, and this is phase one of the rollout. And we have an established call center similar to Erski and similar to the help desk so that you can talk to a real person, so that your work order just doesn't go somewhere. We recognized and we heard that feedback and we see that as a great upgrade for this particular school year. And we will continue phase two and phase three, which will allow for more of the community to be able to see those work orders. So we are excited to bring that forward today. 
We turn this over now at this point for discussion um, on this particular area when we looked at our safe and inclusive school environment. So President Wolf, we turn it over to you. Thank you. That's a, a lot that you have covered. It really is. I want to. I want to start by um, thanking Dr. Evans and Mr. Nelson for being here. I had the opportunity to attend the active shooter training, so I know what a terrific job of training we've been doing over the summer. I do have a couple of questions, though, based on what they said, and it doesn't really concern your building, but you mentioned the addition of cameras in areas not previously viewed, and I do understand the, the importance of getting that in Magruder because the community has already been impacted, but I wonder about our other high schools in particular. Um, we will, um, we did receive funding last year through the budget to look at cameras for our elementary schools. So we are going through the process at this point to see which schools have those, uh, have cameras and are in need of cameras. The second component is our principals will work with our cluster security coordinators to see where there are, might be locations within schools. They frequently go out and do walkthroughs. They support them, whether there's an additional camera needed and really developing and determining, you know, how we do that. That, and or um, if there's a camera that may need to be relocated as well. And so when can we expect that to be completed? Because um, I'm particularly concerned about our high schools. If you um, allow for us to bring that back to the board, uh, President Wolf, I'm okay. thinking um, around October, mm -hmm. um, we will have all of, we will go through um, in September and then we can compile it and provide an update. Okay, and the, one other thing that came up as I was walking through Magruder um, is that the police are not always able to communicate with each other. And I understand that you had done an assessment of um, you know of them being able to use their um, cell phones in the building and we know we need to boost this in some of our buildings so that they can communicate effectively I talked to Ed Clark who said that he had done an assessment you remember that mm -hmm. and I wanted to know the status of that because I never received anything on it and I'm very concerned that the police be able to communicate within the building Mr. Clark, do you have additional information um, regarding that, or do we need to do a follow-up? It's not just Magruder. I, I'm concerned mm -hmm. about all, all of schools, our schools. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. I do. Uh, we're working. Yeah. In Come on down. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Now we're hot. Yes. Um, we're currently working with our police partners and their technology team to sort of make those assessments. Um, the day of the incident in Magruder, they did have a challenge. President Wolf, they had to use some supplemental technology there. So working with our county government officials, our internal communication officials to try to identify those gaps and what we need to do to correct those gaps, whether it's additional technology. We're currently in the process uh, with our new coordinators and the rovers making uh, those type of assessments in the schools to see where the communica communication gaps are. Working with our principals, they generally know those hot spots where there's challenges of communication. So gathering that data and working with our partners figure what are the options to kind of correct those gaps? Because we do know communications are challenged uh, in a critical emergency at different times. But when we when we were at Magruder, you indicated that you'd already done an assessment of the buildings, and that's why I was a little surprised that communication wasn't working within that building. So where is that assessment? That's uh, currently ongoing. We're okay. deploying those teams out to do sort of what we call safety and security reviews. There's different components of those reviews, both physical security, social, emotional well-being, uh, looking at gaps in in technology, uh, training. So these are ongoing comprehensive reviews 
uh, that we work in collaboration with the state. There's certain requirements uh, that all school districts in the state of Maryland have to do these periodic reviews. So we're in that phase currently right now. I kind of think, though, that being able to communicate if you're inside the building on an emergency is important. Mm -hmm. It needs to be put at the Priority. top of your list. Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you tell me when I could expect that to be resolved? I mean, I know you might have to work with the Verizon, AT&T, whoever, but it's got to become a priority that they can communicate if there is an emergency inside any of our schools. President Wolf, let us do a follow up with you. I think, you know, I appreciate you bringing back up uh, the conversation and really looking at what the level of need is within our different buildings. But please allow us to do a follow up around all of our buildings because that's the part that I'm hearing and our actions behind it. Thank you. Um, You're welcome. I also think it's Ms. very. Wolf, I just wanted to say, just to solidify that, we'll just send an update to the entire board. Yeah. Sure. Um, good yeah, to the entire board just to make sure that mm -hmm. we share what uh, we are learning from this analysis because of course from this there may be um, other implications particularly thinking about budget coming up that we may want to get ahead of okay. um, also yeah absolutely that <clears throat> the key fob is that already been distributed because that's another important aspect of being able to enter the building quickly if needed we are still doing, we are working on the MOU between us and Montgomery County Police Department in terms of to get the key five distributed. We are very close and we see that being done hopefully within the next month. I'll provide an update within the other two areas that we just talked about as well. Thank you. And lastly, I just want to say I'm glad the work order system is in place. I've been asking, I've been asking for that since Andy was here. Could we? have a public system so that anybody can look and see where a work order has been requested, when it's going to be completed, or if it's already been completed. Mm -hmm. yep. As you know, we had some tensions over at mm -hmm. Springbrook around the same request over and over. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I'd like you to be sure that paper arrest, when you are looking at your data collection, that paper arrests are included. Mm -hmm and are broken down uh, by demographics. Mm -hmm. That's been, I, I'm very concerned about that issue because you know we, we do have a number of people that are still concerned about um, the, the number of minorities being impacted. And while I don't know that I agree with that anymore or I'm, and I believe that our data does not really support some of this, I do think that this is a weakness paper arrest, and we need to monitor that closely. So I'll, I can provide an update on that, um, President Wolf. Paper arrests are now being termed as a referral to DJS. Um, and we have partnered with Montgomery County Police so that any student that's receiving that referral to DJS comes through our diversion program, which has been set up in student services within the Office of School Support and Wellbeing. And because we're going to try to digitize that, we will be able to track the ethnicity race uh, data for you as well. We're doing that ourselves or relying on the police department? So the police department no longer are referring to it as paper arrest, and maybe Mr. Clark can talk about that. They get a referral to the Department of Juvenile Justice Services, and then we are connected with them now so that once they're doing that, we have that information in-house as well. We have built out our diversion program, and we will be able to have ethnicity race data as a result. You know, I think it's important that we collect our own data to be sure we're getting what we need in order to make an assessment about what's really going on. Thank you. Do I see any other lights? Mr. Kim? Yeah. Um, Mr. Clark. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Clark. If I could just uh, provide a little update um, on the key fob program. Mm -hmm. We are expanding the key fob program. We've had a key fob program in place for the last several years with Montgomery County Police. Because of these ongoing tragedies in the community, that program will be expanded to all allied law enforcement agencies. So we're just updating that MOU. So we're expanding rapid accessibility for officers uh, throughout all law enforcement agencies in the county in the event of that critical emergency. They will be able to get into pre-identified access control doors. OK, thank you. Mr. Kim? Uh, thank you again, Dr. Evans, uh, Mr. Nelson, for your 
continued efforts in the Magruder community and the, the school system at large. Um, yeah, so much great news around health and wellness and food and nutrition services that I know students will be really excited to hear about uh, as we enter this school year. Um, I did want to ask about kind of the alignment between some of those COVID-19 mitigation steps and the um, contingency plan uh, developed in the past year. Uh, you spoke briefly about um, the role that face coverings and PPE will play, uh, the role that screening and testing will play. Um, I wanted to kind of hear about if we can anticipate anything about conditionally introducing uh, mask mandates again or what testing will look like in the next year, um, just kind of the status on, on those pieces. Absolutely, and thank you for your question. Um, as I mentioned, COVID-specific 19 mitigation strategies will be layered on core health strategies and applied in a multi-layered, flexible way. Uh, so the decision about broad universal mask mandates really must be deeper <laughs> than that because masking and testing are strategies that we're going to use at all COVID levels. So understanding what situations and uh, what conditions are important to roll that out in like a systematic way. So if you look at universal masking as the you know broad strategy that is la di da di everybody, <laughs> but is something that you need in focused uh, situations, even at the lowest risk level. As we go from low to medium risk, we stage up, right? So it's not like we don't mask and then all of a sudden everybody masks, but in every situation, there may be local outbreaks, there may be certain higher risk activities and getting more resolution on how to apply masking, how to apply testing based on those uh, different conditions, even at the lowest level in a way that allows us to build up to a level in which those strategies are are approved more broadly. So in the CDC guidance, if you, you know, read it every day, like me, uh, there is a, at the very end, there's a list of factors that can influence decisions about how we implement mitigation strategies. Things like uh, someone's uh, risk for serious complication due to COVID-19, the age of the students, um, and just different factors that you think of when you're, you're protecting people and their health. So the conversations that we are having now are more in-depth conversations internally about about where the spaces, the places, and the people um, where we need to apply these strategies at every single level. Or as we stage up through community risk, how do we broaden in a systematic way using this uh, structured comprehensive framework of, of factors that have been identified for us and that we may in our conversations with the community identify more gaps or more situations uh, when we hear uh, testimonies from our community they're coming from places of, uh, of need of resource gaps and those are important conversations to pay attention to because they will help us embrace how we need to roll these strategies out in our community does that does that make sense more or less. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Ms. Silvestri. Uh, thank you. I wanted to start out by saying um, lots of information, mm -hmm. all great. We're in a good place to start this fabulous school year. I did want to thank you for uh, the update on the International Student Center. Uh, Ms. Harris and I had a chance to visit this uh, month, and so very pleased with the improvements and um, you know the wave is coming we, we see them in September October November so thank you for creating a more welcoming um, space for them um, and thank you to our Magruder team um, for the role that you play in keeping our, our students safe uh, safety and security is everyone's responsibility we all have a role to play in our schools and keeping our students safe and I'd like for us to think about um, our students know who's having a crisis. Mm -hmm. Our students know who's posting stuff. You do too now through the social media monitoring, but they're seeing it uh, live as it's happening. So as much as we can to build it into our uh, social emotional wellness approach, that it's all our responsibility. It's not snitching. You're, you're reaching out because your, your friend, your classmate needs help. So I'd like for us to take that, that approach, see something, say something, but not in a punitive way, but more of a wellness uh, approach. Well, I think if I can speak on this, and, and I think that's inherent in the leader in me training. That really is a vehicle for empowering students. 
helping students understand that they have a responsibility and accountability to do the work of making themselves safe, but doing this in a way where they feel very, very comfortable and who they are, and not being worried about who they're not, and not worried about the peer pressure, but understanding through their own power and acknowledgement that I can make a difference, that I have a place in my own life. And the leader in me training that, uh, you know, in, in all of our schools now, is, is a good vehicle for starting this process of getting them to be fully involved in their own education and safety. I can just add to that because we are very excited to tell you guys more about the expansion of the wellness centers and meeting, but uh, the expansion of youth development supports and organizations like the Street Outreach Network is all part of that proactive approach to mental health and youth support. So it's not just training, but it's having the structures and the people and bringing the community together to support our youth that will help create that culture of, of wellness. Can I just follow up on your comment because this came up yesterday in my visit to Fox Chapel. The wellness centers, are we, are they fully staffed? They're questioning whether or not HHS actually has enough people to staff all the wellness centers. So as that effort is being led right now by DHHS, they would be the best ones to give you a more detailed update and we're happy to help you with that information. If, but it, I don't know if, if you could find out or somebody could find out because the, um, the nurses are questioning yeah. the, avail the availability of nurses to cover a wellness center at all of these schools. And so if they're not being covered, who's going to cover them? Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll do a board follow-up um, just to be able to provide that information um, to everyone just around the status of uh, the staff at each of the wellness centers. And thank, thank you. you for raising that, uh, President Wolf. When we first started the initiative of implementing wellness centers in Montgomery County, we actually started out saying this is going to be a necessary collaborative effort. We have the students and the families who will come into these wellness centers to receive the services, but we said up front, this is a staffing um, piece that Department of Health and Human Services will have to incorporate. As a matter of fact, as we were preparing for implementation, we went and had some meetings together at County Council. Some of the uh, advocacy from Department of Health and Human Services was to really think about implementation in stages so that the staffing would be considered uh, appropriately so that the wellness centers would be able to offer services. So I just wanted to point that out because that was very much a part of the discussions when we first began this initiative, but we will share that information with you. And then of course, um, as we get ready to implement all of the work that the wellness centers will do to serve our communities, it will also be a great opportunity for us to come forward along with the Department of Health and Human Services to talk about collectively how we're working together to provide services, you know, the families, the buildings, the, ref the referral process, even down to the staffing. I, this is very important because if there's advocacy needed on our part, then I mm -hmm. think we should know that, that we need to also be up there advocating on behalf of getting staff because it's also well and good to give us wellness centers, but if nobody's in them mm -hmm. for our students, it's not going to be very helpful. Can I just follow up with that? Go ahead. Um, what is the vision there? Because I was talking to a, one of our school nurses who was saying that she has five, she's overseeing five different schools this yes. coming year. Is the expectation that there'd be one person per, per wellness center and it would be a full time position for them? I'm just curious. I would have to defer that. Well, some of them are health tech. I would have to defer that question to staff specifically. So uh, I, I'm going to ask Ms. Izzard, who has been working very, very closely with HHS, and Ms. Monica Martin to just come down and. and, and okay, I was going to say it can be a short answer or a yeah, follow-up no, too. Be, I just wanted. Be. I was just curious what the vision was for it. No, thank you. Thank you. It'll be a short answer. Thank you, uh, President Wolf, and the rest of the board, and Dr. McKnight. Uh, just to give you a little summary of where DHHS is right now, and if you don't mind, I'm going to read it because it's hot off the press. Uh, the Department of Health and Human Services has contracted with Every Mind, Shepherd Pratt, YMCA, and Identity to provide three positions in each of the 19 identified schools. 
each each high school campus has an area in their building that was identified. The positions are full-time care manager, full-time mental health specialist, full-time youth development specialist, full-time Sun Street Outreach Network, or we're referring to them as school outreach network uh, person, two days a week per week at each high school. Each of the service providers have begun hiring for those positions and anticipate to have all the positions will be in by the end of September or early October. And again, it's hot off the press and that's from DHHS. So we will give further updates uh, in our next board meeting. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you, that's really exciting. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. I'm not seeing any other lights, am I? Oh, Mr. Harris, you have got to move sorry. that bread. Sorry. And go ahead. Um, yeah, thank you again. Um, and I did want to echo um, what Ms. Silvestri said. We had a great visit to um, international admissions with Ms. Borges and um, Ms. Padilla and Mr. Monteleone, and it was really good to see the improved efficiencies in both the technology that we're using and the services that we're offering and um, how we're wrapping around those incoming families. Um, and I also will be interested to watch how we are um, continuing to stay in touch with those children and their families after they are um, enrolled and assigned to a school and we keep that connection with them, with our PCCs and our PPWs and um, cause we all know and our, our PYD, our positive youth development folks, and street outreach network folks, we know those students are often so vulnerable. Um, so I'm going to follow up Mr. Kim's question um, to you, Dr. Kapunin, um, because I know I can already hear in my head all the what I'm going to be hearing from community after this meeting when we talk about um, some of the health metrics, and I agree. So many of our COVID mitigation strategies are just basic health maintenance strategies. You should always wash our hands. We should always stay home when we're sick and, and, and you know, have good you know, ventilation and, you know, clean our high touch surfaces, you know, just common sense stuff. And then, you know, our additional layers when we're talking about specific disease outbreaks that we're trying to address. So when we're talking about, so in the, and I've read it, um, the online, um, the school reopening guide, we talk about um, health mitigation strategies and specifically mentioned that CDC recommends that universal indoor masking be reinitiated when community transmission levels are high. And we mentioned that we uh, may be temporarily recommending or requiring masking in, in conditions of local outbreaks, high risk situations, high community transmission, but there's nothing in there about how that would happen and what our communities, our students, our staff can expect to see and hear and learn from us when we're, you know, monitoring, modeling, and and um, identifying strategies that we need to employ. Yeah, so what I envision, and uh, we're in the process of information gathering, you know, I was speaking with a principal from Longview, we're speaking to sort of uh, listening to the community and also talking to internally about different stakeholders. And those are the conversations we're having right now, sort of uh, how is this going to roll out? What are the implementation, implementation details? So what I envision really is a more comprehensive policy just for masking, a more comprehensive policy just for testing that looks at what are the indicators? You know, were we to implement something broadly in a mandatory way, um, what does that mean for groups of populations who may not be able to safely mask, mm -hmm. right? Like like younger children or people with a medical condition that might prevent them from safely masking. So in any of these strategies, you need to sort of think of all the different groups and how it would be implemented. So well, in addition to the recovery guide, what I imagine or envision is having a more specific comprehensive policy for each of the mitigation strategies where we look at it separately and after these community conversations and technical conversations, really define what are the levers um, and the metrics that we use to, def to uh, identify the higher risk situations and at every risk level how we're going to implement these strategies. So not just to be reactive, uh, but to plan what are the different considerations. And it, it's different. So I mean, you have to look at testing <laughs> and the data and science of testing and the different implementation uh, uh, details of testing separately from asking. So I think that's what we're doing is sort of breaking it down and providing a more comprehensive strategy for each of the mitigation components. So when can communities expect to see that so they can plan and know what to expect? 
So I think that even in the next week, we expect to be able to post something more, at, at least a framework for what they what to expect as far as testing and masking. Um, I, I think some of the infection control guidelines are, are given to us <laughs> by the CDC, by our local health authority and our activities that we do in partnership. Uh, but those mitigation strategies that uh, um, we have more leverage over um, considering our local vaccination rates and our local sis school system factors. I mean, it's exciting to be able to provide medical expertise and to be think to be able to think organically about the community and our needs. So I'm really hopeful uh, to be able to have at least a basic framework with more detail for each mitigation strategy, but also to be able to present to the board uh, a more detailed analysis of what we might want to codify in mm -hmm. terms of strategies, especially when we talk about broad mandates. Okay. Yeah. And may I, if I just wanted to emphasize, thank you, Dr. Kampunin. We knew that we were coming to this year being more specific and intentional. As we learned, even when we were experiencing Omicron, we came up with a great process that basically said, we're now at a point of differentiating based on what's happening in our school community. This is a large school community of 210 schools. And so I believe we're at the point of not needing to say, unless circumstances changes and suggest such, that we need to put implementation strategies in place for everyone. With that said, we have been consistent with a, a few messages based on where we are right now. Masking is still optional. We have ordered masks in school to have them available for those who need them. Um, if data changes and there is a recommendation for that to uh, change otherwise, then we will implement that as Dr. Kapunin is saying. Um, in terms of testing, we have not shifted there. If you, are, uh, if you have symptoms that are making you question whether you have COVID-19, I know right now it is allergy season, and you know everybody's trying to figure out, is it allergies, is it COVID-19, test. Um, and so test if you have symptoms so that then you can be responsible and know that you're coming into an environment in which COVID is not a concern. So those are the two main things that I will point out that are very clear in terms of how we're going into the school year. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I look forward to seeing the specifics. So, you know, as we descend into cold, flu, respiratory illness season, people will be, yes. yes. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I will say to you, I will never stop saying how important I think it is for every single school to be very, very intentional about creating opportunities every day for every staff and student member to get outside, to eat, play, and learn. Um, and for it not to be, oh, well, we, you know, a conversation that starts at a school from, oh, that would be hard because, but a conversation that starts out, that's so important for physical, mental, emotional, and actual health, health. Um, and so, you know, starting the conversation with how we're going to make it an opportunity. Right. So I, I, I will never stop saying that. Okay. Um, and I'm glad. So I think I had a couple questions, um, but I think they'll be covered on February, on, excuse me, not February, on uh, September 8th. But I'll just kind of frame some of the things I'll be looking forward to hearing about when we're talking more about our mental wellness work in schools for to support students and staff. And one of the things that I'm, you know, it's looking like, especially in our high schools, we'll have um, um, an array of individuals with clinical licensure and training to provide mental wellness supports. Some will be our employees, mm -hmm. our counselors, our school psychologists, our licensed clinical social workers. Some will be DHHS employees in our health rooms with the same clinical background and training. Mm -hmm. So wanting to make sure there's a very clear, comprehensive web um, of information to tell students and staff how they can access those services, but we don't see any ping-ponging. A student goes to their school counselor and the school counselor says, you gotta go to the wellness center and the wellness center says you need a referral. No, 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 anybody that shows up and says I need help should get the help, but I, I really wanna make sure that we're really clear about how our, our, our comparably trained and licensed staff working in two different spaces are working together collaboratively to make sure that everybody can get the help they need when they need it. So that's one of the, the questions I'll have and that also goes to um, our so important uh, partnerships with the HHF and our, and our positive youth development and street outreach network staff who are populating our wellness centers and how they're gonna be working more closely with our school-based staff so that school-based staff know that they can make referrals to those individuals as well. So I know I've talked with um, Luis Cordono and some of our PYD teams who've said in the past they didn't ever get referrals um, from 
teachers and counselors in schools, even then when they knew students needed their, their support. And maybe that was because the student, the staff didn't really know about them and their work. And now that this is such so much a, a part of the way we do business to be focused on the prevention and the health promotion, making sure that, that all of our staff members and all of our students know about the availability of those staff to support student needs. Um, so that's one of the things that I'll also be really um, closely looking at um, when we see on February 8th kind of our updates about how all that, um, all those things are coming online. And then also um, I'm hoping we'll hear more about at our July 26th meeting, Ms. Goldberg came forward as an LCSW mm -hmm. and talked about her network of colleagues who could provide us additional supports in our wellness supports in our schools as you know they could help on a part-time basis a tpt basis a per diem basis to come in and, and help support and i know some conversations happen and if we can if that could also be a part of the follow-up we get on um, september 8th to see how those conversations went um, to see if, if that is going to be a resource we can bring into our schools uh, thank you so much, Ms. Harris, for that. Um, I do want us to look at that September 8th agenda. I know we started out the presentation just kind of outlining how do we want to make sure we stick to the priorities. However, the things that you're bringing up are very important. So we will look at what what is what belongs in that presentation and anything outside of that, we will make sure we share that information with the board um, so that you can, everything that you've raised. And I want to circle back to what you said about the outdoor lunch. If you remember last year this time, we made a number of investments yeah. to make sure that those spaces would be uh, utilized and we invested in, you know, like little, I don't, the little pods or seats mm -hmm. that they would have outside to create those spaces. And we said we wanted them to be used for lunch. We wanted them to use for outdoor classroom spaces. And so we absolutely are going into this year, um, while we have nice weather um, and students are wanting to engage in that opportunity to say, how can we still take advantage of, of those moments? So thank you for elevating that. Yeah, and I don't want to put Mr. Adams on the spot. I see him back there in the corner <laughs> looking away. No, um, but I'm pretty, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm being, this is, true, but correct me if I'm wrong, that facilities is still ready to support schools who need some infrastructure permanent or He's or portable to help support like outdoor lunches. He's shaking his head, yes. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> for all of our principals watching and our vast viewing audience know that that there are things available to help support that outdoor activity. Thank you. Thank you. So we can now transition to the last part of it. We want to thank the team that's leaving the table. Thank you to everyone. And we are going to the last part of our presentation, um, which we will focus on human capital management and uh, communication. Thank you. All right. Good afternoon, Ms. Wolf, Dr. McKnight, members of the Board of Education. I'm Travis Wiebe, Director of Human Capital Management in our Office of Human Resources and Development. Under the leadership of Dr. Susan Marks, our Acting Chief. It's my pleasure to be here with you to talk about human capital management, a topic um, that we are all very familiar with and have been discussing regularly. And I know you've been receiving regular updates um, in the weekly transmittal. So I'm here to provide one more update and some, some update and good news around our progress that we've been making. Next slide, please. So, as we have shared, we have been making some great progress in terms of our staffing for our district. We're 99% staffed right now in the midst of a national teacher shortage. Thank you. And it really is a collective effort between and among schools and our offices across central office. And as Dr. McKnight shared, the community as well, right? This is such an important work um, and we recognize that it is not easy um, and it is something certainly that we're proud of. We're not 100% there, but we're certainly much better than we were back um, in July and we continue to fill vacancies on a daily or even an hourly basis. I'm sorry to yep. interrupt. Sure. Um, when you say 99% staff, you're talking about teachers, classrooms? The, or? Entire, the, the entire district, yeah, so of our Okay. But also 99%. Is it also the true teachers. of teachers? Yes. Okay, thank yep. you. Sorry. Sure. Thank you. Yep. Um, and as Dr. McKnight has said, this is complex and nuanced work to staff a district of this size. And we 
rely on our recruiters and our staffing teams within off the Office of Human Resources and Development to really be recruiting and hiring year-round. This is not something that starts um, in March and ends in July. We are working around the clock and traveling locally. The, the team was just popped up at the Wheaton Mall today and yesterday, and they continue to pop up locally. They were at the, the Montgomery County Fair last week, and we will continue to travel both in the area but also across the country so that we can increase our footprint. Um, it, I was talking with uh, Tomas this afternoon. We're planning a week-long trip to Texas because as we talk about our schools that have two-way immersion, we need bilingual teachers. So we need to be strategic about where we're going and how we're getting staff. So we're very proud of the progress that, of the team um, and the work that they have done. And like I said, it's a collaborative effort in order to get to this pace. Next slide, please. So we have even further updated numbers um, from the time that this slide was, was completed, and I just want to provide a little bit um, additional information in terms of our teacher hires. So as of this morning, we've hired 965 teachers, so we're just approaching the 1,000 mark, which is, again, a, a huge feat, and a, we appreciate the work and effort of all of our team members within OHRD. And that's compared to 782 that we hired last year. So again, we're, we're increasing those numbers numbers. As of this morning, we also still have 187 full-time vacancies, 38 part-time, 93 of which are special education. And again, that's uh, within our teacher workforce of nearly 14,000. We recognize also that in the support world and in all of this, the vacancy numbers ebb and flow on, as I said, an hourly basis sometimes where we're seeing separations from the school system, but also, as we celebrated at the beginning of the meeting, an increase in enrollment, which means additional allocations to our schools. So you'll see those numbers continue to shift and adjust throughout the staffing season. Uh, and particularly within the supporting services world. So when we look at those vacancies, and we're looking right now at 442 positions, 215 of which are paraeducators, those positions and our other support positions are not positions that we have a real structured staffing calendar and timeline for. So those are always constantly in movement, and so we continue to see um, movement on that front. And we've hired 483 support professionals since March 1 compared to 363 at this time last year. So again, we're seeing increases in terms of the numbers that we are, um, that we're hiring. So next slide, please. So we know that the staffing landscape and that the shortage of teachers is not something that is going to change in the near term. So we need to be strategic and think about what are our specific actions that we're going to do in order to focus on ensuring that we are not in a situation where we continue to lose strong candidates. So we really are excited about the expansion of our permanent substitute pilot program, something that we launched last February. We were able to hire 50 permanent substitutes, meaning they came every day to, uh, to 17 different schools. So in some cases, there were two or three within a building. They received a higher rate of compensation, and they were there every day to provide the need, especially during that time when we were struggling with high teacher absences due to COVID. So we're looking forward to, to doubling that number um, and expanding throughout our schools as a way to address some of those continued staffing needs. And of course, as we always um, focus around the importance of our partnerships with our higher education partners. That's our goal is to increase those and to expand our pathways so that when we are working with future educators, they have multiple and varied pathways to get into the classroom. So the substitute pilot is a potential pipeline, as are many of our paraeducators who seek um, the opportunity to, to come into the classroom. And we're also looking at how we can bring in career changers as well. The number of conditionally certified educators that we've seen over the last several years has increased. And these are folks who are coming in and have a wide variety of needs. And we really want to make sure that we're differentiating our support to them to make sure that they are as successful as possible when working with our students in the classroom. So we're partnering with our partners at MCEA. And we're also partnering with um, OSSWB and our principals to ensure that those conditionally certified teachers have a clear pathway to, con to get their certification and that they're best suited to serve our students well. 
And then just two other pieces I wanted to add on this slide is, one, we have a strategic recruitment plan. We're going to continue to expand, review the data that we collected over the last year, and think about how we can target particular areas, as I said, in ensuring that we're bringing the best and highly most highly qualified educators to our workforce. And lastly, I celebrate, of course, that, oh, if we go back one, one slide, sorry, the picture um, where we had several board members at our future educator celebration at the end of June. These 12 individuals are now on their way to getting their teacher credentials and eventually coming back to teach in MCPS. We really want to expand that pipeline. We want our current MCPS teachers, or excuse me, students to come back as teachers. We're really excited that we'll have the support of the Maryland Leeds grant to continue to expand this effort. And hopefully when we take that picture next year, we're going to see three or four times as many students. Next slide. So our bus drivers are often the first and last space that our students see. Um, as they're being safely transported to and from school each day. We are in much better shape this year than we were last year. We're currently seeking 32 additional bus drivers. At this time last year, we were around 100. So we're definitely in, in better shape and we're, we're attributing that to additional expanded recruitment outreach, but also um, additional training sessions and even including some on the weekend. So as we think about how planning for the, the start of the school year, staff within the Department of Transportation are analyzing those routes and making sure that there's appropriate coverage. And in the event that, that we have uncovered routes, many of the staff within DOT are CDL holders. We'll be able to cover those routes and also plan how they might um, do some double backs as well. So we, as I said, are excited about the state in which we find ourselves when it comes to human capital management and the state of staffing. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Ms. Rubin, who will lead us through our last section, communication and engagement with our families. Thank you so much, Mr. Weeby. So as we begin to wrap up today's presentation, um, we wanted to take a look, next slide, at how we are meeting our priority around communication between families and schools, that two-way communication. And we really wanna take the opportunity to celebrate some things that we've put in place and um, things that we are hoping we can continue to sustain and grow over a period of time, including among them Thursday's Things to Know messaging, our pop-up shops and door knocking, which has continued and has been hugely successful in our community. We've just heard from community members how much they see that as part of one of uh, Dr. McKnight's pillars about building and rebuilding trust our All Together Now uh, survey promotion, as well as our reopening guide to schools, which is really all right, let's, <laughs> I'm, sorry. I'm sorry, it threw me off. <laughs> and certainly a variety of videos and other resources that we have available to our families. Next slide. And finally, our work around parent view, uh, which is, cro is a cross office collaboration between strategic initiatives and OSSWB. Uh, we have a 81% rate that we're shooting for, for having our families accessing parent view to really be able to stay in tune with what's happening at school, their student progress. Uh, we're happy to say we're at 80% currently, and we feel like we're going to meet our, um, our goal, and certainly we want to highlight that over the last couple of weeks, a 10% jump in our households who are uh, listed as Latinx and African American. So we do feel that this is trending in the right direction. And a big shout out to our parent community coordinators who have played a significant role in helping us to get this uh, to where it is today. And so with that, with that, we would like to next slide. We would like to now spotlight one of our schools who's doing some tremendous and fantastic things around community outreach, building and rebuilding trust. So we welcome Ms. Barbara Escobar, principal of Nielsville Middle School. Thank you. And good afternoon, uh, Dr. McKnight, President Wolf, and board members. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the great things that are happening at Nielsville Middle School. So in June, upon my appointment to the principalship uh, at Nielsville, I felt a sense of urgency about getting to know our community and making sure that that was aligned to Dr. McKnight's uh, three system priorities. In particular, the one that stood out to me was focusing on building uh, a trusting relationship with my community. 
That was especially important to me being new to the Nielsville community. And I knew that to do this, I had to go meet our families in person. Um, I had to go to our communities in which they lived in order to connect in a more authentic manner with our families. So our team's thinking was sparked uh, during a July uh, seminar focused on family engagement and community walk leadership that was um, provided to us by our director, Mr. Christoph Turk. The workshop centered on Dr. McKnight's priorities of building trust, a trusting relationship um, with a signature focus on reimagining the strategies we consider and use uh, in our community engagement. We discussed the importance of generating that trust in neighborhoods that um, our students and families lived and what that looks like through our leadership presence. With a shared interest in increasing our visibility and commitment to innovation, we were committed to engaging in a collaborative and intentional community walks uh, designed to build the relationships with our stakeholders. Our team embraced the leader learning, weaving it into a fabric of our culture, and leveraged the, strategic, uh, the strategy shared to organize our efforts and maximize our impact on our community. My administrative team, uh, several members of our instructional team and our people personnel worker compiled a list of students' addresses, engaged in the community visits, and it was great because we were even able to connect with some of our students and families who have a histori uh, history of attendance challenges. So being able to welcome them and emphasize to them the importance of engaging in the school community was a priority and one that I think that we achieved. We were greeted with bright eyes and smiles, and our students and families were genuinely excited to meet us. We met parents, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, family, friends, who were all part of that powerful network that support our students. Some families were surprised and couldn't understand why we were knocking on their door. And in their curiosity, they asked, why are you doing this? A fair question. Uh, and we explained that it was important for us to connect with them in an authentic manner and welcome them to the new school year. And we also provided them some information about an upcoming event that we were hosting and ensured that we, had, that we knew that they could connect with us and they were receiving our messages. Uh, both families and uh, students asked questions about the upcoming year um, and shared what they were excited about. That for me was something that was important, hearing from our students' mouths what they really looked forward to in the year. The families were really grateful for us taking the time to visit them. Uh, in fact, as I walked away from one of the families, I could hear the students giggling as they were closing the door and exclaiming, I can't believe she came here. I can't believe my principal came to my school. And it's truly not something that happens every day because I recognize that the work that we do is very time consuming and it's not for a lack of want, it's for a lack of um, sometimes being able to balance all of our priorities that it doesn't happen more frequently. The time we dedicated to our four community walks gave us the opportunity to really signal to our families that we want them engaged in our school community. And for my community in particular that is physically very widespread, it was important for me to do that messaging. Each family received a personal invitation and flyer that you see um, there to our Nighthawk welcome, which is in the evening, Thursday the 25th starting at six. Uh, and on the back side were a lot of QR codes with information that our families could have right at their fingertips. Uh, we talked with them about the resources, what it meant for them, and answered questions that they had. We visited, uh, we knocked on almost, a hun oh, actually over 100 doors. And for the families that we weren't able to connect with, we left that flyer there so we knew that they had, so they knew that we had connected, uh, made that attempt to connect with them. So th through this experience, um, there was some learning for me. Um, obviously, I know that my community is beautifully diverse. It is diverse in race, ethnicity, language. However, I also learned that there is a wide range of skills um, in our communities, accessibility uh, to technology and connectivity to the school, um, really by way of how they feel comfortable connecting with the school. 
And so this has, uh, this learning has allowed me to really influence my communication strategy for my community to ensure that there are as many obstacles reduced or eliminated for my families. In short, these visits have allowed me to really begin building genuine, authentic relationships with my students and with my community members. And I thank you for allowing me to be able to share with you today how I was able to do that, focus, focusing on the importance of connecting so that we wrap our kids with that strength of academic and well-being. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Escobar. Uh, the work that you're doing at Nielsville truly does exemplify how we are engaging with our communities like never before, and certainly how you're modeling that at the principal level, at the chief level, at the director level. It's all of our work across the system to ensure that our families are engaged and doing well. So with that, we're going to wrap up today's presentation. We really hope that we've been able to convey our excitement and our readiness for the opening of schools in a very meaningful way. And so we're ending with a video today that shows you across our community how the entire community is prepping for the opening of schools. Roll video. <laughs> I'm very excited about working with my children this year because it'll be our first opportunity to work together the way we used to. So I actually went through the whole MCPS uh, system. So I started at Rosemont Elementary School where I'm teaching, very excited. I'm most excited to finally be able to have um, a group of students that I feel like I can call my own. I was a product of MCPS. It's really nice that I've come full circle, that I'm now giving back to where it helped shape me. I'm most excited about having a classroom to call my own. I've, I love teaching, it's always been my dream, so I'm finally excited to just do the thing. So Ms. Wolf, we turn it back over to you for further discussion. Thank you. I want to thank Ms. Escobar for coming. It's very exciting. I'm always glad to hear when our, when our staff has gone out and knocked on doors. I think that is so important to connect to our community like that. So thank you for coming and sharing your story with us. My question, <clears throat> you know, I have a degree in math, but I still cannot figure out the numbers that keep coming out. So I was hoping you could help me out because I understand that um, hiring is a very complicated process and I may not be understanding what I'm looking at but the numbers today I mean, the numbers seem to go up from the numbers I originally heard at the staffing um, press conference you had and I don't understand the difference between them and even your numbers today you said we have 965 teachers now and yet you said we have 187 full-time vacancies. But if you take that from the number of teachers hired, it seems to me you would have fewer vacancies than that. I'm just trying to understand the numbers and whether or not it's because they're part-time and you didn't, and I didn't take them out of part-time and you did, so. Sure, no, I appreciate the question, Ms. Wolf, and you're right, it is a, a complex, nuanced um, approach and, and the numbers are shifting and changing constantly. So to your point, um, yes, when we look today, we're at 187, which is greater than we were yeah. earlier. And I think there are a lot of different fact, not I think, I know there are a lot of different factors that play into that, one of which is an increase in enrollment. And so when we increase in enrollment, we allocate additional positions to schools. Okay. At the same time, we're also seeing that there are still some separations, right? There might be retirements, there could be resignations as well. And any time that you have that, it's going to also increase that number of actual vacancies. Okay. So we continue to hire throughout, 
but at any point, and, and I, you know, in, in conversations, because we have these conversations daily, in fact, we would be having one right now, but we're, but we're, but we're at the table, so we can have it all together. Um, but we look at those numbers and we say that, yes, exactly, to your point, you know, they increase, they decrease, they ebb, they flow, because there are so many different factors that are at play. Well, I was pretty sure that the answer was there were some retirements that had happened and it raised the number of again, but I wanted you to share that with the public. So thank you for that. Um, am I seeing any? You moved that red thing so I could see. <laughs> Ms. Harris? Um, yeah. My apologies. This is going something I wanted to ask about in an earlier part of the presentation. And it's just a quick point. Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier about um, we, we're, we're kicking off for um, Harriet Tubman, the Harriet Tubman Elementary School. We're doing the ribbon cutting on Wednesday. But you also mentioned our Odessa Shannon Middle School is coming online. When is that ribbon cutting going to be? Mr. Adams, do we have a, a date for the ribbon cutting for Odessa Shannon? You are correct, Ms. Harris. Wednesday is uh, Harriet Tubman. Yeah, it's Harriet Tubman. So, so we are working with the school. So if you remember, the, with the opening of the new building is happening for this school year, but we'll continue to do demolition and site work. So, so we're thinking that we need to get a little bit further along, you know, to make sure that the site can accommodate a, a proper ribbon cutting. So we'll work with the school and certainly get back to, to everyone on the date. Thank you. Just was wondering. Sorry to back up. And then um, just uh, not necessarily for now, Mr. Reby, but when the dust settles on all of our hiring, um, <laughs> will we get some information about sort of the, um, the diversity of our new pool of employees from all different? And it, I'm always happy to see when alum come back to us, how, maybe how many of our new hires are um, products of MCPS. Yes, we have both of those data points and be happy to share um, at a later date. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Joftis. Thank you, and congratulations, Mr. Uh, Weewee, to you and the team. It's really impressive, uh, really impressive work. And I want to thank you, too, Ms. Escobar, for uh, the engagement piece. One of the things that I'm really excited about in the community engagement piece is our expansion of um, community schools. I think as far as an equity strategy, I think it's as good as it gets, right, as far as really being able to provide wraparound services. First of all, Ms. Escobar, sorry, I should know this, but do you, are you a community schooler? Okay. So I'm just curious, um, Ms. Rubin, I'm not sure if this is for you or not, but just and not necessarily right now, but I'd really love to hear more. I know we're expanding as directed, recommended by the blueprint. Um, just if we can at some point get kind of an update on that and a sense of um, how, how well that's serving student and family uh, needs. I think that's all for future, future conversation. Okay. Well, thank you. I'm not seeing any other lights. Uh, I want to thank you all for the presentation. This is really exciting. We're getting... We're getting there. We're getting there. We hope to get to 100%. But of course, we have to deal with the numbers every day. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wolf. I just want to congratulate and thank the team as well. Everybody sitting in this room have, in many different ways, contributed to every bit of information that was shared. When the room was packed, everybody that was here then have been a big part of contributing to the opening of schools um, this year and have been a part of the opening schools of our innovative schools, which started in July. So the process just continues, but I do say I am excited about this year and so appreciative for the work that we have engaged in to prepare for our students on Monday. So we're going to be ready to greet them. And prior to Monday, we look forward to participation at our back to school fair on Saturday, which really feels like the kickoff <laughs> to the year. Thank you. Yeah. I too want to thank everybody again because people don't realize how many Saturdays and Sundays you all work to get 900 and whatever the total yes. number is of, of teachers hired. I happen to know that having talked to Dr. McKnight many a Saturday at quarter to seven in the morning and she's on her way in. So I think it's important to recognize the hard work that you all have done and thank you. Okay, we are now up to our consent items. The, the board is asked for 6.2 to be removed.
from the block, not, not removed, but we will have a table discussion on that. And as you know, as I said previously, 6.10 has been removed from the agenda. Can I get them? Are I'm there any other oh, that need oh, to yeah. be pulled? Yeah, I would like to pull 6.1, 6.7, 6.7, 6.8, 6.9, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32, 6.33, 6.34, 6.35, 6.36, 6.37, 6.38, 6.39, 6.40, 6.41, 6.42, 6.43, 6.44, 6.45, 6.46, 6.47, 6.48, 6.49, 6.50, 6.51, 6.52, 6.53, 6.54, 6.55, 6.56, 6.57, 6.58, 6.59, 6.60, 6.61, 6.62, 6.63, 6.64, 6.65, 6.66, 6.67, 6.68, 6.69, 6.70, 6.71, 6.72, 6.73, 6.74, 6.75, 6.76, 6.77, 6.78, 6.79, 6.80, 6.81, 6.82, 6.83, 6.84, 6.85, 6.86, 6.87, 6.88, 6.89, 6.90, 6.91, 6.92, 6.93, 6.94, 6.95, 6.96, 6.97, 6.98, 6.99, 6.10, 6.11, 6.12, 6.13, 6.14, 6.15, 6.16, 6.17, 6.18, 6.19, 6.20, 6.21, 6.22, 6.23, 6.24, 6.25, 6.26, 6.27, 6.28, 6.29, 6.30, 6.31, 6.32,
Yeah. Athletic trainers. Yeah, I just wanted to give you an opportunity, Dr. Sullivan, to share um, how, <laughs> in part, this uh, piece of procurement um, on the athletic trainer um, is is going to help us with our uh, get up to speed in providing athletic training services to all of our high schools. Yes, we're, uh, we've been working for the last several months to identify individuals and vendors to service our schools. Um, the athletic training program is in its 10th year, uh, but in the last couple of years with COVID-19, the medical field has been impacted in many respects, including athletic trainers. Uh, the certifications for these individuals have increased. Um, and so they've been very well prepared to move up in the medical field and the high school level positions uh, have been vacated in many respects. So we've had to rebid that contract and really um, hit the ground to identify the vendors uh, to service our schools. Um, we provided an update with the start of the fall season. Um, at the time we had 14 athletic trainers in our 25 schools. We had 23 of our schools with a vendor we had two schools that we are still working towards identifying a vendor, Northwood and um, Albert Einstein. We shared that with the community really to be very transparent. We want to show exactly where we were in the process. I'm pleased to say that today um, we were able to pre-award a vendor for Northwood and Einstein. So all 25 of our high schools now have a vendor in place. We still have eight schools that are looking for an individual to fill those positions. So we will continue working uh, with our vendors to get individuals in place for those. But in the meantime, um, our vendors are providing maximum level services uh, to the schools without trainers to give them um, coverage at games, practices to the extent possible, even providing some telehealth um, opportunities. This is new for us in, in the athletics, but. Uh, like many respects in the last couple of years, some new technology and opportunities. So we're very excited about those, um, infusing that into the athletic training program. Uh, so we will provide those services and communicate with the athletic specialists and the principals, as well as our community. Um, by the end of the week, we're hoping to have another community update, just giving a check-in. Um, I have checked in with the um, athletic specialists and principals at, at um, Albert Einstein and Northwood to give that update. So that is where we are. I'd be happy to entertain any questions about athletic trainers. Now we should just recruit, it sounds like. Well, we're excited because I think long term, there's some opportunities for us to look at our model um, here in MCPS. And um, Fairfax County has a very solid model. I was down there last Friday um, collaborating with some of my colleagues in Northern Virginia about the program there. And I think there's some opportunities for us moving forward long term. So. Stay tuned for that. Well, you just have to put in a plug. Yeah. For, so one of one of the terminal options for our Academy of Health Profession students is to get a physical training certificate. So there is a, a, a group of students you might start talking to now. Oh, thank you. Thank you. OK, okay 6.8. Miss. Uh, 6.7 6.8. We did? Together. Yes, OK. Um, I think Mr. Adams could give us um, and these two are just, I want to just highlight some of the work that we're doing um, despite our fiscal, you know, the COVID-related financial, fiscal, and inflationary pressures to keep our projects on time. So, so these two contract award change orders are really important. So I think one, the first one was Poolsville High School. That's a really exciting one. This is the... Uh, the work that will involve a, a new gymnasium. Um, that's the advocacy that has come from the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the community as well as students. Um, but but it also in, includes an additional uh, general conditions associated with the architect. And that work's important as well because if you recall, we had to break this project up into two separate discrete phases in order to keep it on, on schedule. So cost overruns are obviously a, a really impactful element of our, of our school construction program. And we've been trying to look at creative and innovative ways to keep projects on track. And this is one of those. So unfortunately, it does stretch the project out another year, which does result in some minor, minor charges and expenses from, let's say, architects and others that are involved in the oversight. Uh, but it does allow the project to start. It does allow students to move into new space earlier than, than previously expected. And obviously, a, a contract like this allows for 
uh, more opportunity to work with the community on a new gym and uh, hopefully uh, result in something that, that that community really has advocated for and certainly deserves. From a woodwork perspective, that is phase two. Um, woodwork, woodwork, again, for, for those that may not be familiar, phase one is that first build part that will involve Northwood moving in as a holding facility. And then phase two is that work that happens uh, that will really create that comprehensive school at the end. Uh, so the architects have obviously been working very, very closely with community members on, on site aspects. Uh, but the building piece itself really has been at the infancy, and this, this work is, will allow them to take it to uh, full design um, as, we, as we continue that design collaboration and that community collaboration. But, but obviously, as we get closer to, uh, to more of our CIP discussions, we will be discussing ongoing lingering impacts of supply chain and, and labor shortages. We heard today in that presentation, we hear a lot about labor shortages at, at the school level. It does happen in other places, particularly in construction, and that is one of the impactful um, pieces that we've been we've been trying to work with our partners to, to navigate. So, look forward to those conversations this coming CIP. But this is um, hopefully we'll we'll, uh, we'll find your approval for these two items because this is very exciting for both those communities, and, and we look forward to continue that that community collaboration. Yeah, I have to say that Poolsville is very happy about this and. Their gym was built for a school that was sixth grade to twelfth grade, so it gives you an idea of it wasn't the right size for a high school. Thank you. Yeah. So, you have any, thank you. You have any further questions for Sam? No. Okay. And then your last oh. one, Lynn, is what? Um, six ten. Um, the fiscal the FY twenty two uh, end of year category. Transfers let, let me ask a technical question. It's, it's showing a six point eleven on here. No, it's been it's, changed it's, online. You changed it on one, yours? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay, good. Yep. And I just wanted to provide Mr. Riley the, the opportunity, since we get the financial reports in, at every board meeting now or monthly, um, and we've been tracking over time the, the end of year fund balance, you know, projections and things like that. And I just wanted to give him an opportunity to sort of paint the, the final picture for us just briefly. Looks and better I, than it did. I appreciate that, Ms. Harris, because it does speak to the three different phases that Office of Finance looks at our budget and expenditures. So first phase, as you know, is our budget development, which, which the goal is to facilitate the alignment of our financial resources with the board's strategic plan, board's priorities, Dr. McKnight's priorities, and input from the stakeholders. So the next uh, phase is our financial monitoring phase. And that's where, as Ms. Harris mentioned, we're looking at a monthly basis. Where, do, where are we falling in our particular categories with our actual spend to our budget? Um, so that phase actually has some uh, legal mandates assigned to it. So one of them is that uh, legally we cannot be negative in any of these particular categories at year end. Um, so the second uh, goal that we have to meet is that our unassigned fund balance has to be above zero. We can't be in the red. We can't be negative. Um, and the final one, not necessarily a legal mandate, but um, we have to uh, at least save what we committed to, to uh, fund the next subsequent year's budget. So if you recall, normally it's $25 million that we shoot for. Um, this year, uh, because we weren't fully funded uh, by the county, we were almost fully funded, uh, we had to find another $10 million. So you'll see in the, in the packet here that our, uh, uh, that our savings goal target was $35 million. And I'm happy to say we were able to do that. We did that through uh, uh, advancing our uh, year-end cutoff and just uh, using our financial agents within the uh, different departments to really analyze our spend at year-end. So we're able to save $35 million there, so we're okay for next year. Um, and for the positive fund balance, normally uh, we last year we had six point five million. This year we ended up with nine point eight million. And I just wanted to explain it wasn't because we did a bad job of uh, monitoring. Um, and just with that said, that even we're at nine million, and even nine million. That's 0.3 percent of our three billion dollar budget. So, you know, we're talking about a very thin slice that we're uh, heading towards. But there were a couple of reasons why we didn't hit that. $5 million uh, unassigned goal, and that was because of our FEMA reimbursements. And it was mentioned before here, too. Um, we were able to acquire almost $20 million of FEMA reimbursements over the last two years for our um, testing, for our masks, for our PPE supplies. Um, but when we were at year end and we're trying to figure out what our you know, what our year-end balance is going to be. We were told by uh, FEMA and MEMA that um, it's going to range anywhere between two months and eight months. So it was a kind of a tough target to hit. Uh, so 
one of the big ones was nine million dollars and we did get that but we also got an additional 4.5 million that we weren't expecting so that's kind of what threw off our our year and balance so i kind of just wanted to highlight that of, of why we're at 9.8 or 9.9 .9, um, at this point point. and the last phase i just want to mention too is our uh, financial reporting phase so we'll come back to you in november with a hopefully a clean audit because uh, that's where we uh, uh, report on our, our eight funds that we have, the operating budget being the main one. Um, and then we go through our annual audit um, and then we bring that back to you. So that, that kind of closes the loop of our budget development to final audit. So I don't know if anybody had any questions on where we, where we ended up there. Yeah, looking forward to that November meeting. That would be place to be. Thank you. So can I get a motion to move 6.1, 6.2, 6.7, 6.8, and 6.10? So moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. That is unanimous of those present. We are now up to item number seven, which is just for information. Item number eight, can I get a motion to move item... 8.1 and 8.2 in block. Yep, so moved. Second. All in favor, raise your hand. And that is unanimous of those present. Is there any new business? Seeing no new business, item number nine is for information only. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. Second. <laughs> Second. All in I favor, raise your hand. To adjourn. <laughs> and that is unanimous of those present. Thank you.